Okay. So today we'll try to summarize what was uh, proposed and put together to, uh, for the uh, ISA call Voyage 2050 and uh, what is the situation now. So this is the title of my talk, Microwave Spectroparametry of Matter and Radiation Across Space and Time. And I'm giving this talk on behalf of the, the people who, uh, who have contributed to this effort. Um, so the context is this, uh, this consultation of the community that was put together by ESA in, uh, in 2019. And the context is to prepare the, the scientific program in 2035-2050, which seems to be uh, far off, but in fact, it's typically the time it requires to, uh, um, to prepare these ambitious space missions. And um, the difficulty was, there were several difficulties in putting together this thing. Uh, the first is we have to forecast what will be uh, the most interesting things to do at that time. And also the, the, the papers were due in the beginning of August, which is not the best time for everybody. Um, <clears throat> so we decided after a discussion with a number of people to uh, in fact, put together three main papers which describe three science cases, which we thought would be of interest in that time frame, And then because in this process by ESA, there would be the selection of the three themes for the three L-class space missions that would be flown by ESA in that time frame. One more uh, science paper, which described what could be do with, with what could be done with an L-class mission and give an outline of the requirements of, on such a mission to address these three uh, synergetic science cases. So the, the idea was to address these key scientific questions, which, uh, which I think we would probably all agree that will still be of interest uh, in, in a, a few decades, in two or three decades. The first is whether lambda CDM is the final word and whether we should consider extensions and which extensions. Then there is all of the questions of the physics of the dark sector, neutrino sector. This has been with us for decades already. It's plausible that it will be with us still for at least as much time or at least a fraction of that time. The formation of structure from very early times. This is a challenging uh, uh, observational program if you want to go and look very far away uh, uh, in the distance universe and so very early on. There is a question of inflation, of course, which, uh, which everybody is interested in, in particular with the measurement of, uh, of uh, CMBB modes and the question of the theory of gravitation, which we know must be modified in some way is not the final word because it's not a, a, a quantum theory. There is no quantum theory of gravitation. And the thing is that the distribution of matter and energy across space and across time and scales and codes answers to these questions. And so the, the, the exercise was to try to see what we need to do in terms of measurements to get to these answers. So the idea is to observe the universe in the mi microwave. This is a post Planck, post COBE, post WMAP, and post CMBS4 and Lightbird. There is of course CMB fluctuations, which have been observed at, uh, with now already a good accuracy with Planck, but for which there is still much to be done. Um, there are CMB spectral distortions, which is specifically the objective of this, uh, this session here. CMB interactions at all redshifts on their on their trajectory, on the trajectory of CMB photons towards us, probing structures essentially at redshifts, let's say below something like 10, and also <clears throat> atoms, molecules, and dust, which also emit directly in uh, the microwave and could be observed to trace the structures in all of the Hubble volume. And among all of these science cases, um, this one has been already um, uh, used and exploited to some extent, not to full extent, but all of the others are essentially new uh, in the sense that only uh, uh, the, the, 
the science case has just barely been scratched, in particular for CMB interactions, uh, CMB lensing, and SZ effect. There's still much, much more to be done. And the other two here remain to be done completely. OK, so why microwaves? Because most of the radiation in the universe is in the mic microwave, in fact, about 95%. And it permeates the entire universe. So this is probably the best place to look uh, if we want to, uh, to prove the distance universe. Also because the most distant objects emit in the microwaves. This is a spectrum of a typical galaxy at a redshift of 0.1, and then going all the way up to, uh, to 8. And we can see that in this frequency range, which is a, the frequency range we decided to concentrate on, we can observe objects at essentially any redshift as efficiently as if almost as efficiently as, as if they were at a low redshift. So from, from about one to eight, we can detect all of these, all of these objects. Um, <clears throat> It also complements planned observation in the 20, 30 plus time frame, in particular the SKA, which stops somewhere here. And this is the Origin Space Telescope, which covers this, the peak of the CIB here. And here we are covering the peak of the CMB. Uh, again, here the, the, there is a, a nice complement to measure the, the complete volumetric luminosity of distance, distant objects. Why should it be done from space? Because the atmosphere is not transparent in this frequency range. This is a frequency range we picked. It is mostly transparent at low, low frequency, below, say, at 300 uh, gigahertz, but it emits a lot. And so it's very difficult to do very, very precise measurements from the ground because of that. Also, there is a gap in the, in the plans of future cosmic observers at ESA. We have here uh, the, the list of legacy missions, among which Planck and Herschel here in the microwave and submillimeter. And there are active missions and missions in development over most of the frequency range, including here gravitational waves, but nothing here post Planck and Herschel, while there is still a lot of science to be done. And so the idea is to, uh, to fill this gap here. So what we could imagine doing is a space mission with three instruments, uh, sort of a microwave imaging and spectroscopic telescope with a broadband multi-frequency polarized imager. This is uh, here the focal plane, which is planned for PICO with about, uh, with here 21 bands. So this is very low resolution spectroscopy. It's more like multi-frequency imaging. This is what could be used to observe galaxy clusters, also to observe CMB and CMB lensing. It's, uh, it's essentially doing from space multi-frequency observations of the CMB, while from the ground we can do it only in a very limited number of bands, which means that there will be limitations in the, our capability to separate CMB and secondary effects from the foregrounds. Then the second instrument could be a sensitive spectrometer with a, a, a resolution, spectral resolution of about 300, which means three uh, delta nu uh, over nu of one over 300. Uh, a reference model here could be an extended decima at the focus of a large telescope. Here we could have a, an instrument also at the focus of a large telescope. And this would be uh, useful to map all of the lines of, uh, of mo molecular and atomic lines up to high redshift. And then the third instrument could be an absolutely calibrated FTS. Pixie is a reference. We, uh, we are thinking of, of a three module version with three modules which cover different fractions of the frequency range. The idea being that since each module has a noise which depends on the total integrated power in the frequency range it covers, it's possible to avoid most of the CMB emission when we observe at high frequency and when we observe at low frequency for better sensitivity at high and low frequency to, to control the foregrounds. Also, these three instruments would be uh, very complementary because um, 
because one measures the continuum emission. So the spectra of everything, all the spectra that are smooth, like synchrotron, dust emission, etc. One measures line emission, and one measures the integrated emission, including the zero level, which cannot be measured with these, these other instruments. In terms of science, there is, a, a, as I mentioned already, the CMB backlight. I won't spend much time on this because there will be a full talk by Karl Stuff just after me. To do that, we, we need multi-channel observations with polarization and a few arc minute angular resolution. Uh, what we could do in terms of uh, mapping full sky dark matter maps is just to go from something like that, which is the current measurement by Planck. There are also better measurement with better angular resolution from ground-based telescopes, but only on very small patches of sky. We could get that full sky with a signal to noise ratio much be better than one at uh, angular resolution of about 10 arc minutes. And then we sort of reach the, the limit of what can be done with CMB lensing. In terms of progress, it would be similar as going from the COBE DMR delta T map with a signal to noise ratio of about one at seven degree angular resolution, which is similar to this Planck phi map to something which resembles W map delta T map with a, a lot of structures visible, which we can then also cross correlate with any traces of structure to, uh, to, to, to see the, the, I mean, trace the various components of the, the structures from dark matter to baryons, galaxies, etc. Uh, second of, of the science highlights, this is the one which is perhaps the less original because this is being planned also by C CMBS4. Although here we can do much better than CMBS4 with the kind of space mission I mentioned, because we could get over the full sky the type of sensitivity that, is, uh, that will be achieved by CMBS4 on a small fraction of, of sky of about 5%. And so this, uh, this would be about the, the equivalent in terms of sensitivity of 5,000 Planck space missions and 10 times CMBS4. In terms of constraining Lambda CDM and possible extensions, we still can gain as compared to what we have currently with Planck, something like six orders of magnitude with just simple Lambda CDM which gives us a, a possibility to scrutinize Lambda CDM and see look for tensions uh, uh, much better than what is currently done. And with extensions, we can get uh, uh, an improvement over the, the figure of merit obtained with Planck by nine orders of magnitude. It, this means dividing the volume of the error box by uh, one billion. If there are, we will get new constraints. If there, are new, if there are tensions, it means immediately new physics. Of course, what we could do is, is probe inflation better than what can be done with CMBS4 plus Lightbird together, which is shown here on this plot with NS, spectral index, and R. Uh, this is again the, the cosmic variance limit of what could be done, what could be achieved with any foreseeable uh, mission observing CMB polarization and isotropies. But uh, of course, there is this additional probe of inflation, which can be obtained with spectral distortion specifically by getting to this type of sensitivity here, we could check that the spectrum uh, it continues several orders of magnitude farther in, in small scales than what is probed by CMB and isotropies. And we, we heard of that already before in the talk of Joe. Um, <clears throat> then there is a fourth science highlight, which is of particular interest for what we are discussing here, which is to track all energy exchanges with the CMB at all redshifts up to 2 million. And this is done with the absolute spectroscopy. Gives us a way to probe decaying or interacting dark matter, primordial black holes, and so on. We heard about that in the first session. Fifth science highlight, um, we have here a, a, a sketch of cosmic history from recombination through the dark ages, cosmic dawn, when the first stars started to, uh, 
to light up the universe, reionization, and the growth of structure. Now, uh, galaxy surveys can probe the universe only at low redshift, well, up to a redshift of a few, but at a redshift of a few, there are not so many objects. Uh, I think, uh, uh, um, let's see. Yeah, I don't have numbers, but the, 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 the number of objects we can, we can detect would be uh, still a few, a few objects per, uh, uh, per square arc minute or per, per few square arc minutes, which is uh, only a small fraction of the total number of galaxies that there is out there. And then at higher redshift, we can use line intensity mapping. So usually this is, this is meant to be done with the uh, with hydrogen line, the 21 centimeter line. There are a few experiments to do that. However, it's possible also to map the structures in di at different redshifts with other lines, lines which emit in the microwave and will be in the frequency range that is probed by such a space mission. And, and this gives us essentially a way to do what we do with the CMB, that is trace the, uh, the, the seeds of structure, but then at, uh, at lower redshift, much lower redshift, and uh, using a different tracer, using uh, uh, atoms and molecules, which are already present at this time. And in the microwave, there are quite a number of them. There is uh, all of the CO ladder, which we have seen uh, Blanc maps, but which with spectroscopy could be detected all across this frequency range. There is also the C plus line, which is one of the main cooling lines of the uh, interstellar medium. And then all of these other lines, N plus, uh, O1, N2, sorry, N2, there are two, uh, two lines here, O3, etc. And the thing is that by detecting more than one line, I mean, several lines, we can reconstruct maps. Um, and even if we detect objects, we can assign a redshift directly to these objects because we can disambiguate. If we see only one line, we don't know the redshift because if we, if we don't know which line we are detecting, but if we detect several lines, we have a direct measurement of redshift. So by having maps at many frequencies, it's possible to, to decorrelate them, to look at independent uh, uh, maps emitted at independent redshifts, and so look at the structures at different redshifts and measure spectra at different redshifts. Here we have the spectrum, for instance, of the CO32 line at Z equals three. And we have here typical sensitivities that we could target with a full sky survey and with a deep survey as compared to the total spectrum of emissions. So essentially we would be able to measure the spectrum of emission of, of structures at Z equals three, just as well as we measure the spectrum of emission of the CMB at Z equals 1000. And we can do that with several lines, CO, O3, C2 here at two, two different redshifts. This can be done at degree scale angular resolution if we want just to measure uh, fluctuations uh, down to, uh, to degree scales or, or can be done at better angular resolution if we have a, a bigger telescope, but even, uh, even uh, uh, a measurement at degree scale angular resolution would be of much interest. And if we have a big telescope, like a large telescope of three meter class or something like that, then we could detect individually sources with their lines of emission in CO, C plus, etc. And, and uh, with direct redshift information from these lines. And this is here a, a, a forecast of the number of, uh, of objects we could detect uh, um, as a function of redshift per square degrees. So on the full sky, it would be hundreds of millions of sources at redshift higher than one and tens of thousands of sources at redshift higher than, than five, mostly unblended because since we detect them, them with lines, the, the, the spectroscopic information removes for us the blending that is uh, uh, typical of observing such distant sources uh, with a, an imager. And much more, so I don't, I don't want to give the full uh, list of uh, what could be done with a, with a mission like that, but um, typically uh, you can read that. I, 
dark energy action we, we heard from super deep stock, primordial black holes, variations of the constants, all laws of physics across space time, detecting all of these galaxies, etc. Um, finishing by multi wavelength astronomy. So, Five a minutes. few words about <clears throat> the implementation. Um, what we put together in this uh, white paper is, uh, is uh, a, a, a space mission with these three instruments, two at the focus of a large cold telescope, 2.8 meter baseline, 3.5 meter, co cooled down to 8 Kelvin. This means an L-class mission. These two instruments are the focus of the telescope plus an instrument to do the absolute spectrum. And we are thinking of three modes of observation for a six year mission, a full sky survey for two years to go broad. We want to observe everything. This is a legacy value, but then spend about two years on deep patches with low foregrounds to go very deep and to a high redshift in regions which are less uh, contaminated by galactic foregrounds in particular and maybe also an observatory mode for two years with some open time to be flexible because this will happen in, uh, in uh, 20 years or something like that and uh, we need to be able to um, to do measurements which will be the most relevant at that particular time this is what we submitted, but now we need to, to adjust that to the outcome of the Voyage 2050 process. In particular, spectral distortions specifically have been selected as a theme for an L-class mission down to recombination lines. So it means a very, very sensitive spectral distortion uh, mission. And uh, all of the part which, uh, which is covered by these two instruments, which is mapping cosmic structures in dark matter, baryons, and line intensity mapping, is mentioned, but for an M-class mission. For me, it was a bit of a surprise, because if we want a large telescope cooled down to 8 Kelvin, it's difficult to do it with an M-class mission. However, we know that it might be possible to do part of the science as a, an M-class mission. Anyway, this is the outcome of the, of the selection. So these uh, recommendations from the Voyage 2050 are uh, put together in this booklet, which you can find in the ESA webpage. And for a, a large space mission, they specifically mention new physical probes of the early universe. And uh, this theme here follows the breakthrough science from Planck and the expected scientific return from LISA. In fact, uh, there are two options for probing the uh, early universe with new physical probes. One is precision spectroscopy of the fireball universe. Another one could be a uh, um, gravitational wave space mission at a different frequency than those covered by LISA after LISA. So 30 years after Kobe Firas, we can now push the limit of Kobe Firas by another factor of 100,000, reaching the level of 10 to the minus 10. So this gives us the uh, objectives that have been selected in uh, this booklet. Now, after the, the three science teams for the three uh, main uh, uh, large space missions, there are a number of themes which are listed as possible uh, science objectives for M-class mission. And one of them, 3.1.12, is mapping the cosmic structure and dark matter, missing bions, and atomic and molecular lines. So all of the, the science themes we have uh, proposed in these uh, uh, coordinated uh, white papers ha have made it in this booklet. So I think it's a... Uh, it's, uh, big success for the, the teams who worked on that. And uh, I think we, it, it's a great opportunity for us for the, for, for the next decades. So since uh, absolute spectroscopy is uh, selected for the, um, the, one of the possible options for an L-class space mission, we need to think the kind of instruments we, we could fly. What we had put in the, 
in the white papers is a number of options is scaling from a modest size mission to L class mission. And in particular, there was one option with a multi module absolute spectrum meter with a low frequency module, a medium frequency, and high frequency module spanning different frequencies with different spectral resolution and different sensitivity. So this is an option which is copied from what has been proposed uh, with Pixie and with, uh, with Pristine in, in Europe. We uh, could start thinking about possible other concepts with a large telescope if we want to, uh, to keep uh, good angular resolution. It seems difficult to, uh, to do something like that with a three meter class telescope, obviously. We, I'm not sure how, how big we could think, and, uh, but, um, but perhaps moving from a, a design like that to a design with a large telescope and an internal reference might be an option. There is, of course, the difficulty of foregrounds. We have here the CMB, CMB dipole. All of these foregrounds and the black lines are what we want to measure, what we have been discussing here, from Y spectral distortion to mu here at the level of 210 to the minus 8, and here recombination lines. What we have put in uh, 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 white papers was something like that with these three, three modules. We could think what is necessary to go deeper if we really want to go there. But also if we go deeper, we need to find ways to, to, to remove all of these foreground emissions. It's clear that if CMB has spectral distortion, thermal dust also has spectral distortions as well as CIB and all of these things. And so we need, we will need to know them and subtract them uh, uh, with exquisite accuracy. So we need to think about options to spend most of the time on clean patches. This is for 50% sky. If we go to cleaner patches to do the spectral distortion measurements, which we can do anywhere, we can push that down. We cannot push down much the CIB itself because it's everywhere. So we have to measure it as well as these lines from distant galaxies, the CO ladder, C2, N2. We could use for that also ancillary observations with big ground-based telescope and whatever we have. And perhaps also try to extrapolate spectra to zero foreground. Uh, so do measurements in various, uh, uh, various patches of sky. Use the fact that these fluctuate while these should not fluctuate uh, so much over the sky. Okay, so this is the, the end of my talk. I think I'm just in time. Um, fundamental questions in cosmology remain unanswered. There are many of them. In fact, we don't know much of our universe, despite uh, sometimes our, our pride of having understood that there is dark matter and dark energy. Tiny signatures in the cosmic microwave background, the microwave sky in general, encode answers to uh, many of these questions and their measurement requires an L-class space mission. Now we have an opportunity to build one and we need to, uh, to start thinking what kind of designs we would like to, to fly. It could have an enormous science impact, revolutionary for cosmology with a huge discovery potential and high legacy value for many branches of astrophysics. And it's a unique window in our universe. It's available only from space because of the, the uh, the terrestrial environment is not compatible with such, such sensitive measurements. We could try to measure all scales from the Hubble volume sizes to individual objects at all times, do spectroscopy with unimpeded frequency coverage from 10 to 2000 gigahertz or so for a comprehensive exploitation of the CMB and isotropies, polarization, spectrum, interactions, but we have to do that in the context of what has been uh, written in this ESA report. And so now we, we have some work to do. That's all, thank you. Thanks a lot, Jack. Um, yeah, we're a little bit behind time, but I think we, we can still have a couple of questions. Uh, let's try and unmute everybody and uh, give a round of applause to Jack. Um, so uh, questions to Jack. <clears throat> Maybe I can start what? with one, um, please. Uh, yeah, I had the questions. 
uh, I was not at the at the Voyage Telecon uh, at the last Telecon on the report, but I was wondering what would for 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 the things moving with ISA, uh, what will be uh, will will it be based? I mean, is it uh, asked to to show uh, that we can achieve the what could be the limiting factor that we cannot achieve the science we 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 project or uh, if uh, the missions is too uh, too expensive for uh, L class? What, what what? Yeah, I think it's both. So the, the biggest challenge. And the, the, in terms of the L-class mission, science themes are selected. And so the, the, the work that remains to be done is not so much to convince that the science is, is, is uh, compelling. This is done already. What we have to do is to show that we can do a space mission that can achieve this science within cost. So it's so more technology, te technology and cost optimization more than, OK. Well, technology and cost, and also maybe demonstrating that we can that we have a, a, a sound uh, strategy to deal with all of these foregrounds. So I think these are the main things that we need to work on uh, very soon. Maybe um, Jack, can you uh, mention as well the gravitational waves, um, uh, of course, being uh, you know quote unquote mentioned for this uh, for this topic uh, for the science theme. Um, what is your perspective on their uh, on their um, you know uh, development uh, and and gearing up towards uh, you know a mission proposal? How do you think uh, things stand there? Well, I I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this question, but um, so I think they are in a similar situation than uh, than a spectroscopy CMB spectroscopy mission, which means that. What they will have to do is to uh, demonstrate that uh, they can build a space mission within cost. And whether or not it will be more challenging uh, for them than for us, I don't know. But um, certainly uh, the fact that LISA has not been launched yet um, makes it, um, I think, difficult to. Uh, to plan with uh, with full knowledge what should be the next step. You know, however, um, I, I, I'm sure that they uh, they have compelling ar arguments that it can be at least attempted, uh, since uh, otherwise uh, it would not have been uh, mentioned in this booklet as something which could be considered for a future L class mission. Yep. Very good. In fact, for, for all missions, I think there are several options. Well, at least two options. Um, and, and here it's, it's the case too. I think we have to, uh, to, uh, to work and uh, convince ourselves that we can build something reasonable within cost that achieves the, the science. And then we'll see uh, how, how easy we put that, um, you know, we'll organize the selection and so on. I assume okay, that I, as they did last time, they will select uh, the, the L-class missions before most of the M-class missions for this uh, for, for this period. Right. But it's just an assumption. I have no proof that it will be the case. Very good. I think um, let's maybe move on uh, uh, to to Kaustub. Um, so thanks a lot again, Jack, for your for your nice talk. And Kaustub, if you want to share a screen, um, I think Jack, you might need to stop sharing uh, before. Um, great. All right. Very good. Yes. So I will give you a five minute warning. Um, Sounds Kaustub. good. Yeah. So hello everyone, uh, I'm Kausto Basu from University of Bonn and I will talk about CMB backlight science that uh, Jack already mentioned. And this, this is the figure you already saw in Jack's presentation that we put together to highlight the diversity of uh, this backlight science, which unfortunately uh, got omitted in the uh, actual published version in the experimental astronomy. But anyway, that was the paper uh, that uh, 
uh, was submitted in response to the ESA's Voice 2050 call with a large number of contributors. So my talk will be partially to give you a flavor, the theme that Jack mentioned, uh, to give a flavor of the diverse science that is possible when one uses uh, CMBS backlight and also to show some uh, present uh, recent uh, progress from our end what we, uh, we are doing on this theme. And uh, as you probably got from Jack's uh, presentation, the science case for this, uh, this backlight paper is really something like super Planck a satellite, which we learned later the science committee was not so, uh, very favorable for on, but that our, our goal for submitting this paper was to really highlight the very large number of non-CMB science that is possible in such a CMB mission with large telescope and large number of frequency channels. And this may not have been very clear to many uh, other fields of astronomers and we wanted to highlight that. And you see, you see in the right hand side all the science themes we tried to highlight, which by no means was a comprehensive list. We had to make some selections based on the uh, participants who joined us. But if from starting from galaxy evolution, astroparticle physics, realization history, the science uh, theme is extremely broad. But at the basic level, the CMBS backlight science boils down to only two things as CMB photons propagate from the last scattering surface to our telescope, they, uh, have two, uh, th they suffer two, two effects. One is they get deflected by the gravitational potential and uh, they get scattered, scattered mostly by the free energetic electrons, but can also be from neutral or ionized species, which is Rayleigh scattering and resonance scattering. So um, my apologies for uh, including lensing in this talk, which is of course, uh, Lensing being achromatic, there is no spectral distortion, and this spectral distortion is the theme here. But in lensing studies, all the techniques that are used for uh, foreground removal or modeling, these are same uh, as, as other spectral distortion studies. So I think it fits here. And also lensing, um, what, what I uh, will focus here is more on small scale because the large scale coherent lensing at few degree scale where the power lensing power peaks so that is already very well constrained from Planck. You, one does not need very high resolution exponent for that. And the science for scattering is of course very diverse uh, from free electron scattering which is the SZ effect, there is astrophysics or galaxy cluster which I also focus on and there is also uh, the state of the baryons in cosmic filaments and then there are cosmic reanalysis and metals from the first stars which are from resonance scattering. So let's continue on lensing by galaxy clusters. It is a very simple effect on a few arc minute scale where the deflection angle of a galaxy cluster is appreciable. Uh, the CMB's uh, fluctuations have almost died out due to silk damping. And so a first order, one, one ex Taylor expands the Remap, lensing is a remapping by the deflection angle. So the, in a Taylor expansion of the remapping, only the first order term is sufficient, which is nothing but the gradient of the CMB. So there is a gradient and that putting a lens in front of that kind of reverses the gradient. And so if one could subtract the gradient behind, one is left with a dipole kind of pattern. So there are many different methods to uh, get to that. And this dipole's amplitude gives a measure of the deflection uh, 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 field or the cluster mass. The signal is very small. Uh, the typical gradient is roughly 10 microkelvin per arc minute and uh, deflection is of the order of one arc minute. So the signal is roughly 10 microkelvin. In passing, I wanted to mention another effect that we mentioned in the backlight paper is the moving lens effect for tangential velocities, where instead of the background gradient of CMB, the cluster um, tangential motion in induces a, a gradient itself. And so this is proportional to not to the CMB gradient, but the tangential velocity, so one order of magnitude lower, but uh, we discussed in the backlight paper that this might be very interesting in the near future and probably 
more promising for detecting cluster transverse motion than polarized ACC. Coming back to the standard cluster lensing, which has been uh, very successful. Here are two examples from the recent SPT poll data. Here is they're using the temperature data, many sigma, I think over 20 sigma detection. Here is also SPT poll uh, polarization data. So you see stacked Q and stacked U. So you actually have three independent measurements of cluster lensing from uh, I, Q, and U, uh, or I, E, and B. Um, and here are some predictions that went into the backlight work. And you see the black is, uh, this is the fractional uncertainty delta M over M. So lower number is good. And typical uh, noise level of future CMBS4 or the voyage that we considered, the temperature is still doing better than polarization, but its noise gets flat. It hits a floor, and this floor is all the temperature foregrounds that are correlated with cluster, TAC, KAC, dust, and they, they all leave residuals in the CMB map, which cannot be completely removed in standard method. For example, quadratic estimators that, that exploits the coupling between different Fourier modes, different multiples. On the other hand, the, all these extragalactic foregrounds are uh, roughly un, mostly unpolarized, so in polarization, one can keep on improving the signal to noise. But at least in the foreseeable future, we thought uh, temperature is still going to provide us uh, with a better signal to noise. So can uh, there be some alternative uh, method for removing these foregrounds? Because standard quadratic estimator does not give any specific recipe for doing that. It depends on the foreground removed small scale lensing map that one can prepare. So with uh, master student Kevin Levy, this is uh, his work and the paper has been uh, almost completed, we should submit soon. We tried a very simple approach. We just stacked many thousands of cluster lens maps that is typical for CMB cluster lensing studies after finding their gradient and aligning them and subtracting the background by means of preparing a background map from random position and then we extract this dipole, which had been done before. Here you see this work by Raghunath and Etal. But instead, we then reduce the degrees of freedom by taking a 1D profile, not fitting in pixel uh, to pixel space. Uh, our motivation was that we wanted to work with less number of clusters. And this is how the profile looks like. The real advantage of this method came out to be that if we stack many cluster, the, the lensing signals are randomly oriented and they get canceled, whereas uh, the foregrounds can be modeled from the data itself. And this is what we see from the method that the KC increases the variance, does not include a bias. TAC provides a bias, but can be corrected. And the signal to noise, for example, SO or SO plus feast, will be roughly 20 and with CMBS for wide like 100, uh, like 50 to 60 with 100,000 clusters. So it's a very simple method that works with, uh, nicely with uh, for foreground mitigation. That's about lensing. Let's move on to SZ effect for the rest of my talk. Uh, SZ effect uh, will not need an introduction. Hideki yesterday already talked about that. The focus mostly had been thermal and KSC effect for cosmology. The, this is a sample of uh, the largest uh, SZ catalog now we have from the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. But of course, uh, the, the goal is always to try what science can be extracted from higher order terms. And this is a sim simple exp uh, expansion from the Southern of Sunia, the intensity, relative intensity change. And these two terms have uh, uh, got a lot of attention. One is the temperature squared term, which is the relativistic thermal SZ effect. And also recently the relativistic kinetic SZ effect, which is the product between velocity and temperature. So we had a collection of this SZ science in our voice paper, of course, cluster number count cosmology. And of course, I forgot to mention on top of that, there is polarized SZ and non-thermal SZ. I'll come to the non-thermal SZ at the end of my talk. And some of these were highlighted in the Voyage paper, not all of them uh, got, could be mentioned uh, the, uh, at the time, but relativistic SZ and the thermal SZ signal got special mention. So let me try to slightly uh, highlight that. Relativistic SZ is nothing but the 
uh, next order spectral shape change uh, due to the electrons reaching really relativistic energy. So non-relativistic approximation is not sufficient anymore. The kinetic SZ also gets a similar uh, change, which is the relativistic effect on kinetic SZ, which is much smaller. Shamelessly advertising why we got into this uh, relativistic SZ business because of a telescope that is now being built now in Chile at 5,600 meter altitude, which is called Fred Young Submillimeter Telescope Feast. But most of you probably know it as CCAT Prime, and we should start taking data late next year or early 2023. And this is the proposed, uh, this is the first light receiver that is being built. It's called PrimeCAM. CCAT Prime, due, thanks to this uh, location, it will provide excellent frequency coverage from 280 to almost like 900 gigahertz. And when combine that data, this is- Five minutes. Thanks, Nils. When combine that, that, that data is combined with other low frequency instrument like SO or uh, even advanced ACT, and the range of science possibilities will be very, uh, SE science will be very extent, extensive. So with this start, work started with a work by Jens Seller, who was a PhD student. Also, Jens was heavily involved, and we also start, used his uh, ZBAC code for this purpose. Our first try was with Planck data. We wanted to see what, how much on the uh, C, uh, cluster temperature can be constrained by Planck data alone. And it was something like two sigmas on the borderline of claiming a detection. But with CCAT prime, uh, we also was making predictions for a single cluster, uh, we thought this is really starting, probably we'll start seeing a temperature of that, but this prediction excluded at that time the atmospheric noise, which at least will kill the prospect of a single cluster, we believe, but we can still stack clusters. And this kind of stacking analysis and also for future space-based mission has been was, uh, highlighted in the Voyage paper or by following very nice work by Mathieu who actually used a uh, temperature expansion of the SZ intensity and the first moment, which is Y times the temperature derivative of the intensity. And use that for Pico-like experiment to show how a temperature of a Kuma cluster can be measured. There are also, for, on the other hand, relativistic kinetic SZ effect, a recent paper by Colton et al. also considered its detection possibility at low L. In the last two, three minutes, now let's visit the other SZ effect that also has not been uh, directly detected, and that is non-thermal SZ effect. Non-thermal SZ is uh, coming from any electron distribution that is not thermal, but most of the time this is a power law tail of the cosmic ray, uh, sorry about the sound, uh, 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 electrons which are uh, accelerated by shocks. And here are some uh, spectral energy dist uh, uh, distortions for monoenergetic electrons. We know inside clusters these electrons exist because we see something called giant radio halos, but the total th uh, energy budget in non-thermal electrons is tiny, only one, two percent compared to the thermal electrons. X-ray people have been trying to detect that for a long time, but has not been, uh, have not been successful uh, because it's very difficult to separate from very high energy X-ray uh, Bremsstrahlung spectrum. But uh, so we wanted to see what we can do from the SZ effect. Here is just a plot from Thorsten Enslil, which is more than 20 years old, and he's made some annotations. So it really highlights that this whole terra incognita that we have after the thermal energy range, we really don't know anything about the uh, energy distribution of the non-thermal electrons. We know they exist from synchrotron, but it's a product of magnetic field and electron density. We don't know exact amplitude. So with a, a paper that is being written now by master student Vyoma Muridhara, we tried to see if the next upcoming CMB experiment can directly constrain this inverse quantum signal. And by constraining the integral of the non-thermal electron in a population. So it, one has to assume a shape and given a shape, we could start putting some constraint. We initially tried to do this with Planck, could not do the detection, then went to forecasting. What I want to highlight is this one thing is that for a typical galaxy cluster for one micro Gauss central magnetic field, the volume average magnetic field strength will be like this. And some limit we get already from SO plus FIST is above that. 
That means we can start ruling out some of these simplistic models. So this is uh, really uh, very exciting because we do, you don't have such direct handle on the volume average cluster magnetic field. So that's all I have to say. Uh, so sorry if I went a couple of minutes extra. So in a nutshell, we, uh, I, apart from all the myriad of voids, uh, the CMB backlight science, I talked about a simple CMB cluster lensing estimator that works nicely against foregrounds. We showed the prospects of non-thermal AC effect. And I mentioned some of these signs that would be possible from the FEAST uh, or CCAT prime experiment. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks a lot, Kausto, uh, for this nice talk. Um, uh, a round of applause, if we can. Good. Okay, questions. Uh, Kausto, uh, you you mentioned uh, kinetic relativistic AC. You mentioned um, non-thermal AC and also the moving lens effect. Um, will the moving lens effect in particular have any uh, serious contamination from rotation of the cluster as well, which is which is one of the KSE effects one expects? Um, what is your it, feeling? It, of course, uh, it, of course, and it is your master's thesis work, Jens. But yeah, I, I, the, goal, the way to detect this uh, moving lens effect is, of course, to find correlation with the galaxy density, right? Whereas the cluster rotation will be uncorrelated. So just the same way that the kinetic AC is. So from this correlation, one has to find this. Any other questions? Okay. If not, then uh, maybe we can uh, move on to Sylvia. Sylvia, you want to share your screen? And um, yeah, you have 15 minutes for the talk and uh, I will give you a five minute warning and then we have three minutes for, for questions. Yeah, except that I don't see my screen, no? We, we see your screen perfectly, everything good. Okay, okay can, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, does, it disappeared. Anyway, uh, I'm speaking about uh, COSMO, uh, so Cosmic Monopole uh, Observer. Uh, and in the name of a collaboration, which is uh, uh, several institutions, uh, several funding agencies uh, that you have seen there. Uh, speaking about the spectral distortions, uh, as it was very well introduced by Jacques uh, of the CMB monopole, uh, we, we, we know now that uh, they are recognized as a, a unique way uh, to study several processes uh, which were happening uh, at different epochs. Uh, you need the evolution of our universe, uh, and uh, by now, for, for now, only upper limits uh, are existing at uh, millimetric wavelengths, uh, and these are of the order of uh, 100 part per million. So, obviously, the final measurement is uh, certainly uh, requiring a space mission, uh, but uh, Meanwhile, uh, waiting for this uh, space mission, pathfinders, so let's call them this way, smaller <laughs> experiments are really needed in order to develop and test the, the instrumental uh, configuration and uh, also to detect uh, the, the, the largest uh, distortion. So the wide distortion, uh, which is uh, due to the presence of uh, ionized uh, matter in the post-recombination universe. Uh, this one is about uh, 50 times uh, smaller than the current uh, upper limits. Uh, and what I am reporting here is, uh, is uh, on a stage effort, uh, which is called uh, COSMO, uh, which is uh, first implementation uh, in uh, Dome Concordia, so Antarctica, and uh, the following one uh, on a stratospheric uh, balloon. Uh, so observable is small, uh, which is compared to almost everything. Uh, problem is uh, uh, of the spectral distortions of the CMB monopole uh, is that they are very small. Uh, and they are small with respect to other isotropic backgrounds, in, which includes uh, the instrument emission, the atmospheric emission when it's present, uh, for example, in ground experiments, but also to some less extent in uh, stratospheric uh, missions. Astrophysical foregrounds uh, from interstellar and medium, uh, mainly interstellar dust, and our galaxies, uh, they are galaxies which uh, 
are along the line of sight and uh, the CMB monopoly itself. So the instrument has to be a cryogenic one uh, to reduce uh, its own emission, which complicates our life, obviously, and uh, operate where the atmospheric emission is uh, very small and uh, or can be measured and obviously subtracted. COSMO is a cryogenic differential Fourier transform spectrometer, so a differential instrument which compares the brightness of the sky to the brightness of uh, an accurate internal black body, uh, exactly like uh, COVID virus. Uh, here you can see uh, on the left uh, the figure, uh, the, the optical configuration of a generic uh, differential Fourier transform spectrometer with one input uh, port which looks at the sky and the other one uh, which looks at the, the internal calibrator. Uh, now, assuming that the emission of the internal calibrator is uh, accurately uh, known, the measurement of the absolute brightness of, uh, a sky, of the sky is uh, obtained by uh, inverse Fourier transform of the measured uh, interferogram, which is described by this uh, first equation you see uh, below. Uh, the calibration constant is instead measured uh, by closing the sky port of the interferometer with another accurate body radiator. Uh, on the right here figure, you can see a, 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 a sketch of uh, how the DFTS uh, is implemented inside Cosmo. The details I'll, I'll give later. But let's focus now um, on uh, uh, the effect of the atmosphere and on the optical uh, window. So here is uh, uh, what you have in the two cases. Uh, this is a, a, a very schematic sketch of what happens on the left uh, for an experiment, which is uh, uh, looking at the sky from space uh, and on the right, uh, uh, which is uh, looking from ground. So in the, in the left uh, part of the figure, uh, you have uh, uh, the instrument, which is looking with nothing between uh, the signal to be measured, so CMB plus the foregrounds, uh, which are present, and uh, the DFDS. In the other part, uh, the, the experiment looking from ground, uh, you have uh, obviously the emission of the Earth atmosphere and uh, the emission of uh, the warm part of the instrument, which includes the vacuum window and filters. And those uh, must be uh, obviously minimized and then uh, measured and uh, subtracted. Uh, even in the calibration uh, with the same scheme as before, so left side is a space mission, uh, ground based is uh, on the right side of this slide, uh, you have a different situation. So uh, in, the, in the experiment looking at the sky from uh, the ground, you have to have a, a vacuum window, which is needed to keep the calibrator black body cold, and its emission has to be then minimized and subtracted. Here is uh, uh, what we uh, are doing uh, to cope with uh, the window emission. So with the window common mode emission must be measured, as we said, and removed with a high accuracy. So a special subtraction, uh, subtraction uh, procedure, which is based on the comparison of uh, the emission of, uh, from one or two uh, windows which are stacked, has been studied, and this is part of, uh, of a PhD thesis of, of a student of mine, Lorenzo Mele. I'm sorry, I, I didn't have uh, the, the picture of Lorenzo to be put here, but uh, in the future, uh, you will, several of you will, will see him because he will be talking also in some meetings uh, about Cosmo. Uh, so the measurement works uh, alternating a second window, which is identical to the cryostat one, in and out of a beam uh, while looking at the external calibrator. So changing the temperature of the external calibrator, one can retrieve the emissivity of the window. Uh, the preliminary results uh, which comes, come, came out are that the window emission can be subtracted and the expected uh, residual uh, uh, is uh, smaller than the target distortion, assuming uh, about uh, 2 10 to the minus 6 for the wide distortion. Uh, so this is, this is a, a relevant thing for the ground-based measurement. So in ground-based measurements, the window is uh, normally high density polyethylene or ultra high de molecular density polyethylene. And uh, the, the thickness of this window is of the order of uh, uh, 10 millimeters, one centimeter thick. And this uh, is needed to withstand the one bar of atmospheric pressure. 
For the balloon borne measurement, in which, uh, depending on the height uh, reached by, by the balloon, we have about three millibar, the window thickness can be reduced uh, a lot to a fan, few tenths uh, of microns, let's say, and this issue uh, becomes less uh, important. So here uh, you see how uh, Cosmo uh, operates, uh, will operate, uh, will operate at, uh, as I said before, from the Concordia French Italian base in Dom C, Antarctica. So one of the best sites uh, in the Earth, on Earth, and it's extremely cold and dry, but still uh, we have to cope with, uh, cope with some atmospheric emission. Uh, it uses uh, fast detectors, so kinetic inductance detectors, and the fast uh, elevation scans in order to separate the atmospheric emission and its long-term fluctuations from the monopole of the sky brightness. Then uh, the other trick is to use uh, a, a fast spinning wedge mirror. You, you can see a particular orbit, uh, I mean, a sketch of it on the left, uh, on the right uh, downside of, 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 the, of the picture. Uh, the, the, the speed is, uh, is uh, very high and this steers the boresight direction on, on a circle which is about 20 degrees, but this can be changed by simply changing the, uh, the green part uh, which is behind the mirror, uh, the gray mirror that you see uh, in the picture. And uh, this uh, uh, scans uh, a range of elevations and uh, corresponding, obviously, optical depths, while the cryogenic interferometer is scanning the optical part uh, difference. Uh, so here you can see a simulation for a single measurement, measured interferogram, which is obtained by scanning uh, slowly uh, the optical path difference between the two arms of the DFTS. Uh, while the wedge mirror is spinning fast, uh, so that for uh, each optical path difference, uh, we have at least one sky dip uh, down and one sky dip uh, up. So you can think of this interferogram as uh, many interleaved uh, interferograms, uh, one uh, for each elevation scanned by the instrument. For this even, uh, if you resample the interferogram with uh, the appropriate phases, uh, you can retrieve the interferograms corresponding to the different optical depths uh, of the atmosphere and extrapolate to zero air mass using the, the classical Cosecant law. Uh, here is five uh, minutes, two possible. Livia. Sorry? F five minutes. Ah, okay. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> so uh, here is uh, two, um, two different configurations uh, which are possible because we use. Uh, uh, very fast kinetic inductance detectors, basically the same ones that we developed for, for Olimpo with a time constant of the order of 50 microseconds. Uh, this means that we can measure short uh, interferograms order of 10 seconds uh, and effectively remove all the atmospheric fluctuations at longer time scales so without affecting the measured spectra. And in the table, you see two possible cases. So this is a, from the interferograms at different elevations. This is done for one particular frequency, but you can do it for, for every frequency of your spectrum. We drive the spectral brightness versus the optical depth. And uh, assuming the second law, we can uh, extrapolate the sky brightness cleaned from atmospheric emission for each frequency uh, of the coverage band. So this is uh, our naive. Uh, naive end-to-end -end simulation of this procedure, assuming that the measured, uh, the measured spectrum of uh, the atmospheric emission in uh, Dome C and one year of integration. And this produces this result for the expected measurement of the spectral distortions. The expected uh, wide distortion is well detected and Lorenzo Mese instead has uh, carried out much more detailed uh, simulations for his PhD thesis. Here we have assumed, for example, to observe uh, from Don't See at the high elevation, scanning every day 11 sky patches, each uh, 20 by 30 uh, degrees wide, as visible in the bottom left map. The map is uh, in galactic coordinates and simply displays the location of these patches, uh, all at different galactic latitudes, assuming interstellar dust template from Planck and perfect atmospheric and window emission removal. Lorenzo has uh, carried out uh, uh, 
an ILC uh, analysis uh, uh, for simulated uh, Cosmo data to separate the components and obtaining a seven sigma detection of the molecule uh, wide distortion after one year of integration. Now we are carrying out uh, an analysis, uh, adding also uh, some, re relative, some realistic uh, spectra uh, of the atmospheric fluctuations uh, that we measured in DOMC some time ago to see how well, uh, how the small residuals we get after filtering uh, affect this result. This is the top level, the schedule of the project. Uh, as you can see, we are in the middle of verification of subsistence. So I'll describe very briefly what uh, we have. Uh, the instrument is inside the pulse tube based cryostat, which is a twin of a uh, developed with success for cubic uh, Cryostat, here are the dimensions at the mass. And then the spinning wedge mirror for sky scans is uh, mounted on top of the vacuum window. There is a, a for baffle, uh, which protects the spinning wedge from stray light. The interferometer operates uh, at a temperature close to 2.7 Kelvin. And the optical path difference modulation is obtained by translating one of the two roof mirrors uh, that uh, uh, by means of a frictionless uh, cryo mechanism, which is actuated uh, um, uh, electronically. Uh, this is the on-site implementation. It's basically a container. I don't uh, spend too much time on this. So these are parts uh, that are being built. And this is uh, uh, the room temperature performance. I mean, uh, measured, uh, we measured performance. I didn't report uh, data here. But uh, the cryogenic di DFTS, uh, requires a cryo mechanism to move the, the roof mirror, as you can see from this uh, movie, uh, which is also mm, visible on the bottom uh, left uh, part of the figure. And the cryo mechanism is based on a voice coil to push and pull the mirror. And this is suspended through these flexible steel blades uh, so that the mechanism is totally, well, almost totally frictionless apart from the eddy currents, uh, which have been minimized uh, using the electric coil uh, support. Uh, the detectors and the feed arms uh, are inherited by the Olympo ones, which, by the way, were the first in the world to be launched and used successfully on a stratospheric balloon in July 2018. And here there are the two papers, uh, two of the main papers uh, exiting from that. Uh, the two arrays uh, for uh, Cosmo cover the band uh, between 130 and, uh, and 160 gigahertz and the 200 to 300 gigahertz. Uh, uh, and they are uh, under study together with uh, the um, uh, multi-mode feed horns uh, uh, and optimization is uh, going on. The black body calibrator is for now shaped uh, as you can see in this, uh, in this uh, rendering uh, and uh, is a, an empty horn basically, basically lined with a CR110 and this shape is being optimized to maximize the number of reflections. Performance forecast uh, based on geometric and electromagnetic methods uh, gives a reflectivity lower than one part per million, so to be better evaluated uh, with uh, custom measurements. And the fabrication of a copper support for validation prototype has started recently. The future of Cosmo. The future of Cosmo. One minute. Uh, for, yes, I, I, I'll be I'll be done. Uh, really, uh, is a. Uh, almost the last one. Uh, the future of Cosmo is uh, for now a balloon borne uh, instrument. Uh, we plan to reuse uh, the, um, the LSP LDB payload uh, uh, parts, some parts of it, uh, which work in the polar night. Uh, uh, there is a suitable cryogenic system uh, uh, and uh, we possibly can add a slower sky modulator if needed. And we may, might gain a factor 10. We studied this uh, within the Cosmos uh, collaboration. There is a phase task, a study, which uh, has been given uh, to Italian space agency. And this is uh, the result from that uh, study. Synergic effort is in France uh, going on. And uh, we are part of that collaboration, which is driven by uh, Bruno Maffei. And uh, in, the name is Bizu, and uh, you will hear from Bruno uh, later. Uh, <clears throat> later. Uh, conclusion, uh, basically, without me to read uh, all of these, uh, these, uh, these parts, uh, I will say I would resume uh, saying that uh, waiting for Voyage 2050, uh, the need of smaller experiments, both ground and uh, balloon based, uh, can give us uh, uh, a demonstration of a control of, uh, on systematics that is needed for the space mission. 
And uh, so this is, uh, I stop here because I, I believe that my time is uh, over. Thanks a lot, Sylvia, for this nice talk. Um, another round of applause, everyone. Just briefly unmuting. Very good. Thank you. Thanks, um, thanks other... for, in, for inviting, for giving me the possibility to talk. <laughs> um, are there any questions for Sylvia? Matteo? Maybe just a quick one, and it probably already answered and I just missed it. What is exactly the timeline for, let's say, when do you expect to have data? Okay, the, the, the timeline that I have shown was uh, before the, the, the COVID, uh, but let's say uh, by the two thousand end of 2022, we should be in DOMC, deployed in DOMC. Uh, now with, uh, with the pandemic situation, there have, have been some delays in some uh, uh, subsystems parts, uh, many uh, which were under our direct control here in the department are built and uh, they are functioning, but some parts uh, still need to be uh, given to us. So as soon as we have uh, the parts that are missing, uh, we will start uh, uh, integrating everything. And we, we, we would like to, uh, to respect the, the 2022 uh, uh, commissioning. If not, uh, uh, in Antarctica, as you know, as you may know, uh, there is a delay of one year. You cannot go in the, in the middle. If you lose uh, that season, you, you miss one year. All right, thank you very much. Jack, I see you also have your hand up. Yes, I'm, I'm curious about uh, how to subtract the impact of the optics. So you mentioned that you put a second window, but- Yes, um, uh, yes, I can uh, show you. Here it is. Uh, so you have uh, you have a second window, which uh, yeah you see this is in, in on axis. Maybe you see my mouse now. Yes, yes. You see my mouse. So uh, there is uh, this uh, second window, which uh, is uh, uh, put in front uh, or in and out. So it is on a chopper. Imagine a chopper. So one blade of a chopper is substituted by the second window, which is exactly the same one as the, the, the first one. And so you can separate the, the two. If you write down the equation for the signal for the S1 and S2, and then you subtract the two, you are able to, to find the, the emissivity of a window, which is what you need. Obviously, here there is the assumption that you know very well uh, your uh, black bodies, both the internal one and the external one. The other little assumption that uh, I didn't mention, and we need, uh, because we are, we are doing calculations right now, these are preliminary uh, results, uh, is uh, what happens if uh, the temperature of a window changes uh, in time. For example, I do this uh, calibration uh, in the lab, uh, uh, with, uh, with a thermal back body, and I, I, I see which is the, the, the emission from, uh, from the, and the receivity of the window at a, a temperature which is uh, TW. I, I mentioned the temperature TW. Then the temperature changes. You need to repeat this again. So we were thinking uh, uh, of doing this uh, in a periodic, periodical uh, time. Uh, time, uh, time wise, let's say, basis. Okay. So, for example, we have to monitor very well which is the temperature of a window, and I can do it today, and I can do it tomorrow, and so on, in order to avoid the problems coming from the not uh, known temperature of a window. Very good. I, I think we might need to move on. We're already a little bit behind schedule, um, but I think we, we, we should be still able to finish in, in time uh, for the full slot. So um, thanks again, uh, Sylvia, for this nice talk. And uh, next is Boris. Um, thanks to you. Okay, uh, I guess you can see my screen. Uh, so hi everyone. I'm no, not yet. You need to you no. need to share still. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. 
Okay. So is that working? Yeah, that looks great. Thank you. Great. Oh, one sec. Okay, so hello everyone, I'm Boris. Today I'm going to present a new spectral distortion constraints on low mass decaying dark matter particles. So this is work made in collaboration with Jens Kluber and Richard Batia. So spectral distortions are a powerful probe of the thermal history of the universe. They can constrain uh, dark matter candidates with coupling to the electromagnetic sector. Since this typically inject energy into the photon baryon plasma, which generate departure of the CMB spectrum from the black body law. So in this past decade, the number of studies have derived constraints on the dark matter cross section, the mass, the lifetime, and the abundance of the decaying or annihilating dark matter particles. The spectral distortions, they are generally characterized by the chemical potential mu and the Y parameter, which are directly proportional to the injected energy and can be compared to the uh, Kobe and Firas bonds. However, the mu and Y distortions are generally not sufficient to characterize the full distortions. This is the case when the injected photons don't have time to undergo many scatterings or comptonize. So here on the left plot, you can see the standard distortion spectra associated with uh, the mu distortion in orange and the Y distortion in red. And on the right, there is uh, the typical distortions from decaying pa uh, particles with long lifetime. So for those, we see not only a wide distortion here, but also a peak in intensity at the rest mass of the decaying particle. So then our goal is to extract constraints from the full distortion spectra. So that is a challenging problem because it requires to solve the Boltzmann equations for uh, the Boltzmann equation for photons simultaneously uh, to the time evolution of the electron temperature and the ionization history. So to do so, we use the numerical code Cosmotherm as well as uh, packages recently developed in Manchester, a CSPAC to compute the Compton energy exchange and BR pack to compute the Bremsstrahlung emission coefficients. Um, we used a standard reionization modeling, as well as a refined tra treatment of helium and hydrogen uh, recombination, initially based on RECFAST. And to run all these codes, we developed a Python package so that we could uh, compute in parallel many distortion spectra and their corresponding ionization history. So in the uh, spec dist uh, package. So we focused on a dark matter that a dark matter particle that decays into two photons, each carrying half of the rest mass energy of the decaying particle. We also considered dark matter excited states where one photon carries the energy difference between the excited and the ground states of the decaying particle. So the time evolution of the dark matter particle population is described by the exponential decay law with a decay rate gamma that is the inverse of the lifetime. So the de decay rate, uh, this quantity, determines the time of the energy injection and consequently the type of distortion that is generated in the CMB spectrum. For very short lifetime, we expect either no distortion if it falls in the thermalization era or a mu distortion, then a Y distortion in the Y era. And post uh, recombination, we, for injection that happened uh, post recombination, we expect more complicated shapes due to photons that do, do not have time to scatter and simply redshift as the universe expands generating the peak uh, that we saw on the previous slide. So for the spectrum of injected photons, we used a narrow Gaussian that, that approximates a delta function centered at the uh, rest mass energy of the decaying particle. And the normalization of the spectrum is directly proportional to the abundance of the decaying particles. 
which we can also write in terms of the dark matter fraction that we can then constrain. So once the distortion is computed, we proceed with the exercise of comparing it with CMB frequency spectra measurements, such as the residuals from Kobe Firas and the edges brightness temperature at 78 megahertz. So we also uh, have used complementary constraints from the perturb ionization histories that affects the te uh, CMB temperature and polarization anisotropy power spectra. So the left plot here shows several ionization histories for a particle that decays uh, during the end of recombinations with different masses labeled in dimensionless units here. So for some of this uh, ionization history, we found interesting time evolution with periodic spikes uh, when we switch on the effect of collisional ionization. So in principle, this ionization histories uh, can be fed to Boltzmann codes like class or CAMB to compute the CMB anisotropy power spectra and extract constraints using the Planck-like use. But the faster method is to use a, a projection method developed by Luke and Jens recently. So here the ionization histories are projected uh, onto eigen modes from a principal component analysis using the Planck data, which allow us to derive uh, constraints from the CMB anisotropy with a simple root finding routine. So, um, Benefiting from the exquisite measurement of Planck and W map, the constraints from CMB anisotropy are the strongest when dark matter candidates um, decay near recombination, which is essentially where the CMB is emitted. However, the good old Kobe Firas spectrometer measurements actually beats the imager constraints for particles that decay far away from recombination. This is the case here in this uh, uh, lifetime uh, region and there. And this is because the spectral distortion, they not only probe uh, the era near recombination, but the nearly the entire thermal history. So here I'm just illustrating this point using the wide distortion constraints. But now we can also actually make use of the full spectra. So in forthcoming works, we will be using machine learning methods to build optimal uh, spectral distortion emulator um, to emulate uh, the, the spectral distortion and ionization histories. But for now, we uh, basically computed a vast library of uh, distortions so that at any point in the parameter space, spanned by the lifetime mass and abundance of the decaying particle, we can interpolate uh, the pre-computed spectra and compute the likelihood values given the Kobe Faras and edges measurements. So our model independent constraints are shown here. On the left plot, we see the maximally allowed dark matter fraction as a function of injection energy in electron volt. So the thick line here uh, is associated with a short lifetime for a particle that decays at early time towards the end of the mu distortion era. And it is essentially the constraint that one would obtain with a simple uh, mu distortion estimate calculation. But there are two differences. Uh, here in the region between 0.1 and 10 electron volt, the chemical potential is actually negative. Uh, and that yields this uh, departure from the horizontal uh, asymptote. And there is also a small bump here at one milli electron volt, uh, which is associated with photons that have redshifted down to 78 megahertz, where we have imposed that the CMB brightness temperature should not exceed the ex edges data point. So for longer lifetime, the uh, straightforward line constraints here corresponding to mu or y estimates is nearly absent. Uh, it's uh, more messy. And the constraints are driven by the extra redshifted photons 
uh, that do not scatter efficiently and end up either in the Kobe Faras or the edges frequency range, generating those peaks in the constraint plot. So for decades happening near or after a combination, we also see strong constraints on the dark matter fraction for energies higher than the ionization threshold of hydrogen and helium. So these are driven by the wide distortion caused by heating from Lyman continuum absorption and analogous process uh, for helium. Five and, minutes. Uh, thank you. And on the right plot here, we show the full constraints in the lifetime versus uh, injection energy plane with darker colors corresponding to more exclu excluded regions. So one piece of modeling that is absent here are quantum effects that would be present once we decide on the bosonic or fermionic nature of the decaying particle. So in our paper, we treated the case of bosons uh, for which the emission is stimulated by the ambient CMB photon bath. The effect of the stimulated decay here is uh, relatively simple. The decay rate becomes frequency dependent with a term that includes the photon occupation number evaluated at the injection frequency. So for this, we use uh, the black body law to compute this term at the injection energy. For very high injection energy, x inch, both the stimulated decay rate and the standard decay rate are equal because the photon occupation number uh, is extremely small. But for low frequency, um, this n gamma goes as one over the energy and um, is higher at high redshift. And so the difference between the stimulated decay rate and the standard decay rate can be very large. So this is illustrated on the left plot here where uh, for the blue distortion, we have a particle that decays um, with the lifetime of the order of the edge of the universe today. We see uh, the familiar Y distortion here and the peak that is roughly at, uh, located at the rest mass energy of that particle. And in black, we see the case for the uh, stimulated decay so in that case, the particle has decayed uh, a very long time ago um, in the mu era. And instead of the Y distortion, we recognize uh, the familiar mu distortion. So this is also illustrated on the right, where we compare the dark matter fraction at each decay rate for fixed injection energy, delta rho over rho, three times 10 to the minus five. We stimulated decays, the lines in red, one essentially needs much more particles to yield the same amount of injected energy at fixed lifetime and in particular at low uh, masses corresponding to low value of this uh, dimensionless X inch. So with this extra piece of modeling uh, of stimulated decay, we can revisit the constraints of uh, this previous slide and obtain uh, the constraints, the full constraints with stimulated decay. So at high injection energy, we see no difference between the uh, standard decay and the stimulated decay. The contours are the same. This is consistent with what we just say. But at low frequency, we see that the uh, region, the contour plot is tilted toward higher lifetime also consistent with the example in the previous slide. So these plots, these two plots are the main model independent result uh, of our work. And by model independent here, I mean that we have not chosen a specific type of particles. So these are actually generic photon injection constraints. On the uh, top right corner here, we have added a green exclusion region, which comes from um, the non-detection of X-ray lines that uh, would uh, that are expected in decay of sterile neutrino, and in fact our work actually directly constrains these as well. And finally, we have translated our constraints to uh, axon-like particle models, which are shown here. 
So the uh, axon-like particle um, models impose a relationship between the lifetime and the mass that is parameterized by the coupling constant G A gamma gamma. So we can uh, translate the uh, energy axis to the mass and the lifetime axis to the coupling constant to obtain uh, those constraints. So um, here the right plot showed, shows a zoomed in region of this plot where we see that our spectral distortion constraints are uh, competitive with other astrophysical constraints from telescopes or horizontal branch stars. Uh, so uh, to summarize, the main messages that I wanted to convey is that we are still harvesting insight into dark matter from 30 year old uh, spectrometer data. And um, I do think that there is no doubt for the next spectrometer mission to be a game changing for dark matter models. Um, yeah, that, that's it. I'm already one minute late. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Boris, for this nice talk. Um, let's give a round of applause real quick. Excellent. Um, questions? Hideki, please. Yes, uh, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, just a question the uh, someone relate uh, uh, decay dark matter with uh, kind of SH tension. Uh, uh, do you have some more kind of uh, test the model also to mitigate the SA tension? So are you referring to the uh, sigma 8 tension? Ah, yes, yes, it's the sigma 8 tension, yes. Uh, in the context of the uh, decaying dark matter particles that I have uh, talked about here and studied, I don't, uh, yeah, I am, I, I am not uh, familiar with types of model which would elevate the sigma tension. Uh, okay, so. But maybe some other people can jump in. Yeah. I will think about it. Thank you for that question. Okay. Um, any, any, uh, any other question? On which time scale are you planning to um, uh, do the uh, emulator? So um, I guess over the summer, um, I'm gonna start some projects that involves emulator and it should, it is a very low hanging fruit now that we have this, um, all this library and the way to run the code in parallel to build the emulator. That just requires a little bit of familiarity with the machine learning methods. But yeah, that should be a great uh, project. I'm very excited about that. Yeah, very, very good. Um, thanks a lot again, uh, Boris, for this nice talk. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe Luke is the next person in line. Luke, if you want to, uh, Boris, you might need to stop sharing screen uh, before uh, uh, Luke can actually start sharing. Luke, take it away. Um, yeah, 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 sorry, just give me a second. Uh, hang on. Um, okay, we need a little bit of um, propaganda. So I put that there as my virtual background. Um, cool, okay. Right, yeah. Okay, is everything looking okay? I'm just gonna time because I'm very good. Of time. Please, yeah. Very good. Okay, cool. Cool. So, uh, yes, uh, thank you for uh, letting me talk. <laughs> obviously, it's going to, obviously a lot of the work I'm going to be talking about is is um, yeah. So there's a lot of work here that's uh, currently being written up, as it were. But um, it seemed very appropriate to talk at this this particular part of uh, at the Marcel Grossman meeting. Um, and I had to change my virtual background to be the New Horizons and Cosmology Spectral Distortions white paper cover because we, you know, there are so many reasons that we should be talking about spectral distortions and 
one of the ones that I'm most excited about, one of the ones I've been most interested in thus far studying is looking at the actual sort of um, physics of recombination um, and looking at how we could maybe, well, first of all, look at how we can constrain it, looking at how we can constrain it with Voyage 2050, but even further than that, looking at how we could maybe even test a little bit more cosmology. So, um, you know, I'm very conscious of time, so I'm going to try and not bore you with too much of a recap. However, just as an overview, we do need a little bit of a recap for those of you who aren't familiar with the recombination radiation, what it is and, and, and uh, what, it, what, it's, what it stands for. Sounds a bit weird, but you know what I mean. Then I want to talk a little bit about some forecasting work that I, uh, that I did uh, part, part of last year, um, looking at the first sort of realistic, first tangible signs of cosmology constraints that we can ever look for with these particular distortions. And then finally, I'm going to talk to you about something that we noticed in that particular analysis where actually, um, yeah, there's a very sort of simple addition to the cosmology of the recombination lines, which can act, act may give us some future constraining power as well. And we're currently in the model development stage of that, so you can see exactly where we're at. So just as a recap, um, I, I dish this graphic out all the time just to sort of talk about the actual process of recombination from the atomic physics point of view. What happens electrons and photons are in equilibrium because of high temperatures um, and you know because the effective rate hasn't come down the uh the hubble expansion overtakes the effective energies and rates are then lower um and so what starts to happen is uh protons start to and electrons start to um come, uh, come sort of join together uh you sort of get a detachment from this thermal equilibrium and then you get recombination and photon decoupling um, do, can I just check, is my signal okay? Because I'm getting a bit glitchy here. Is everything okay? Well, I can hear you there. well. Everybody else, okay? Yeah, okay, cool. That's fine. It's okay for me. Everything. Just, just like do the Team America secret signal if I, if I, uh, if I go a bit, bit hazy. Okay, so uh, I don't want to dwell too much on this recombination graphic because we're not going to talk about the atomic physics too much. But one thing I do want to just say is, you know, obviously, most of the time in context of the recombination, we talk about how the free electrons are moving around, how that affects the um, electron density, columns, Thomson scattering, CMB anisotropies. But today what I want to look at is how the photons that come out of this process actually start to perturb the black body. And so therefore, you don't really need to worry about um, anisotropies in this particular instance. What you're more worried about is, um, is well, it's the photon field. You're worrying about perturbations to the black body caused by the actual processes during recombination that alter the ionization history. And as those populations of different energy levels within recombination change, you get, um, you get sort of perturbations to the black body. And that's how we end up with spectral distortions known as the, as the recombination lines. Uh, and this is a graphic that was generated for the Voyage 2050 white papers. I, re uh, I recalibrated it for with the more up-to-date Cosmos spec code for uh, a paper that I wrote with Jens and Aditya last year. Um, but essentially, this is a very, um, a very uh, low intensity spectral distortion, but very rich in um, spectral features and information. There's lots of stuff going on here. Um, and if you're a fan of sort of back to basics, I say back to basics in quotation marks, atomic physics style stuff, you can really see how that works in the early universe and what the consequences would be on this type of distortion. There's lots of stuff going on. Um, and this is just a sort of few examples given in the hydrogen helium lines here. Um, the takeaway message is this is a unique spectral state compa shape compared to the very smooth shape you get with mu or y. Um, and so this is just sort of a taster for the cosmology that we did with this, um, where, where we were trying to look at the response in comparison to the recombination radiation as a whole. And so you can think of the curves here, they've been weighted such that if they start to approach the orange curve in each case, that means there is detectable as the signal it itself would be as a parameter response uh, in terms of getting any sort of measurable of the error. Um, and what's really in interesting about this is the actual cosmology going behind this. So for example, the baryon density, you increase the number of baryons, you increase the possible chance of these scattering events, you perturb the black body more. And so um, one popular phrase that's been used in the literature is this idea that the uh, CRR can be a baryon meter. When I say CRR, I mean the cosmological recombination radiation, this distortion. Um, you get sort of good symmetry between the two pink curves on these graphs here, which is the dark matter 
in the left and the uh, the N effective on the right because they both alter the uh, they both alter the distortions in terms of the uh, expansion rate and hold on to that that will be important later. Um, but yeah, you then get these sort of weird and wonderful variations coming from the two photon decay rate. If those of you have heard of that before, it's a very prevalent process of recombination. And if you change the primordial helium abundance, all of this stuff is really interesting and they're very unique signals. Um, and so this is what happened when we tried to do sort of a preliminary forecast. This is a sort of foreground treatment um, uh, uh, off the back of a lot of work that Max Abitbol did several years ago. And then Adich just sort of adapted it into this really lovely Fisher code. Um, and as you can see here, these ratios that are given in the table um, are a ratio of the area you could expect with Voyage 2050 versus the area you could expect with Planck, or should we say 10 times the sensitivity of Voyage 2050 first preliminary uh, scan ideas. And um, yeah, we're seeing a lot of power coming out for, y, uh, for, NF, for YP, but also potentially longer term and effective as well. Um, Okay, so I'm rattling through this, but sorry, I'm just very conscious of, of, of time and getting through everything. So I, I come back to this cosmology slide because one of the things I just said to you was the N effective and lambda uh, and omega C are merely measured through recombination through their altercation of the expansion rate. Uh, and so what do I mean by that? Well, recombination uh, is not a simple process. However, for those of you who've worked with Boltzmann code and sort of, uh, transfer functions and things like that it almost you would look at the Hubble function as a simplicity in this regard it is it is basically changing the background physics by which the should we say the pantheon of atomic physics is happening in the foregrounds um, and so both parameters yeah they enter the problem through the same way um, one good example of this is just some sort of rudimentary scan of the hydrogen helium and the this is the doubly ionized helium recombination curves where um, the two photon and the, what, the helium abundance um, affect the terms in different ways because, of course, primordial helium starts at recombination uh, redshifts very, very high, whereas this A2S, 1S, 2 photon parameter, it only really affects hydrogen recombination. It is a hydrogen recombination parameter. And so whilst that is sort of completely opaque to the helium recombination epoch, YP affects both. Um, and you get this sort of interesting behaviour where um, a change in the two photon rate, it, as I say, is completely decorrelated. And it's very hard to see any sort of change in that in the helium lines, whereas YP doesn't have that. Um, and there are feedback processes between helium and hydrogen as well, between the two epochs, which I'll talk about in a second. And so, yeah, you get this really interesting sort of dependence. Um, another case to talk to you about is N effective. So N effective alters the hydrogen and the helium lines in completely different ways because obviously you're changing the radiation density at a time far earlier than recomb uh, um, you're, you're changing something in the expansion rate that is happening far earlier than hydrogen recombination. And so you end up with these unique imprints on the two different parts of the, uh, of the, of the recombination lines. And so you ask yourself, well, is there any other way we could look at constraining the effects in the expansion rate? Um, and one very obvious uh, and one very popular toy model of how you can do that so far is when you consider early early dark energy now this has obviously been documented to to, to, to death um i've heard lots of people talking about dark energy obviously we've got the context of the of the hubble tension and so forth but just a reminder for those of you who aren't aware it's basically this is this idea of including a, a new particle that behaves kind of like an ultralight axion this is one particular early dark energy theory i must add um, for, again, for people who just aren't aware. And you have this oscillating potential according to this ultralight axion particle, which affects the, um, the equivalent energy density coming from this particular dark energy in a very, very uh, pliable, malleable way. You can change uh, the scale at which this becomes important, the amplitude at which this becomes important. Um, and it's not, it's not the only model that this is, this is done for. Um, but it's really nice because if you use the fluid approximation, it's fairly easy to sort of implement. And there are numerous people who've done it. I've included some citations here. Um, and so, yeah, this is just an example of something that uh, this is just a basic sort of background model of what happens to the densities, uh, the unnormalized densities compared to these um, radiation and matter densities. And of course, if you start playing around with the parameters, Five you minutes. can change the slope of how fast. What's that? Five, Five minutes. minutes. 
Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, and then the index den denotes the, the steepness. So um, let's look at that in the context of what's actually going on in recombination. So here's a movie to show you what actually happens as you change. So say you have like a, a, an FED, a fractional EDE of 0.5 at a given redshift. Well, if you keep moving this, um, if you keep moving the redshift at which this particular field becomes dynamical, you start to have these various implications on the Hubble rate, depending on how fast that energy starts to dilute quickly at this given redshift. And so you can see here, if I start playing around with these models as they are looked at typically in the literature, it actually starts to con conflate and, and attack, if you will, different regions of recombination in hydrogen and helium. Um, and another point that's really interesting about the early dark energy question is the fact that obviously it's in the context of the Hubble tension, you know, a non, a non zero early dark energy would push for a higher hit Hubble, which would resolve a lot of the Hubble tension. I don't need to go into the Hubble tension. I'm sure you're all probably been to the seminars and have probably heard enough about it. Um, and I'll just add the caveats. That obviously, Mikhail Ivanov is showing that large scale structure could have a wider implication on that, whether or not it fixes it. And I certainly want to plug the next talk by Matteo, which is where the story gets a lot deeper when you start talking about spectral distortions. I don't know whether he's going to be talking about dark energy specifically, but in terms of the Hubble tension, you know, this is this is a very, very hot topic. Um, and it would be, I'd be remiss if I didn't plug the fact that the Hubble tension can also be solved by a lot of mechanisms. And I just point you to a paper that Jens and I wrote where we discussed the fact that the fundamental constants could actually serve to, to fix this problem as well. So yeah, just a little quick, uh, cheeky, uh, shameless plug from me. Um, but this is what this is then what would happen if you include those background rates in the early dark energy calcul uh, in, in the recombination lines calculations. And what you see here is depending on what type of dilution mechanism you have and what type of model you can strain, you, you, for certain amplitudes of early dark energy, I've chosen quite ridiculous ones here, but just to uh, uh, just to illustrate, you, you get start to get this really interesting um, feature behavior. And these movies will all be available in my GitHub soon so that people can sort of see and, 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 and they're all sort of, uh, um, Anyway, um, so yeah, so this is really interesting. And I wanted to isolate just a few quickly before I have to go um, about uh, some of the features that are actually really interesting about these particular models. So for example, if you choose a low redshift model that dominates hydrogen recombination, it doesn't matter what early dark energy model you do, that suppresses the features, okay? It really heavily suppresses the features in the recombination lines, which is interesting because that could give us some constraining power of future missions. Similarly, you see the Barma and the Pasha Alpha lines there, which are given in, uh, in the right hand side. And um, when you just sit yourself to the n equals two matter like dilution mechanism, um, the higher you in these higher redshift, higher redshifts, regardless of which one you pick, you start to suppress those particular peaks as well. And so the take home is the transitional line features are suppressed by the CDE mechanism. And another one, which is a really nice recombination, I'm aware of time, sorry. Another one, which is a really nice uh, recombination uh, feature is this helium one absorption peak, which comes from feedback into play between the hydrogen and the helium epochs. It's a really nice feature of the helium lines. And you actually get this um, astonishingly much larger. I mean, obviously the amplitudes are quite high here, just for your, just for your uh, information and illustration, but, um, but I don't know why I've put happy there. It's supposed to say happen, <laughs> sorry. But the higher uh, absorption means um, that actually your matter-like dilution starts to make this peak, this absorption even more uh, prevalent. And that's, so these are the features that we're extracting with these models, which is really exciting. Um, anyway, I wanted to finish just there. Um, spectral distortions, just the, these are my take home messages. Spectral distortions aren't just mu, y, r, and s, z. They're the, um, r, I mean the residual. Uh, the recombination lines are there and they are they are predicted by lambda cdm if they're not there we're all in trouble okay so that's why i think they're really interesting and they give us lots of constraining power um they give us a unique cosmological probe due to the fact they have these weird and wonderful spectral features uh, and the design compared to some of the more sort of simple shapes you'll see in, in other typical distortions and i think for future spectrometers this is going to give us a lot of power that we never really knew we had and finally, um, we can start changing the expansion rate and having a weird and wonderful effect on this observable. And we can go, the sky's the limit as long as we can get spectrometers that can detect this. And I just want to figure, fill, fill this out by saying that uh, I really wanted to be able to show you how electromagnetic variations that, uh, such as what, what happened with this fundamental constant work that Jens and I have already worked on. I wanted to show you how that, vari that variation into place because the atomic physics is much more complicated. 
but um, we are still just just beyond the finish, just just the wrong side of the finish line for that one. And the final results debugging on that are coming through now, and we're 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 looking for very promising results. So anyway, thank you for listening. Um, I appreciate that that was very rushed, but if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks a lot, Luke, um, for this nice talk. Uh, a round of applause, anybody who wants to unmute. Uh, questions? Matteo, please. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, very nice presentation. And uh, yeah, uh, my question is more whether you already had some at least rough estimate of the actual constraining power you feel you could have on early dark energy or in general on H0 from specifically the cosmic, uh, cosmological recombination radiation, or whether it's too early to say, or maybe I just missed it. Sorry, Matteo, my, um, my, head, my, head, uh, my headphones dropped out halfway through that. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, I, I was just wondering whether you could already, you, you already have some estimates or, or at least know the numbers um, of the constraining power that you feel the cosmological recombination radiation would have on uh, early dark energy or models that you would look at, or whether that's too early. Yeah, so, yeah, it's a little bit too early. We haven't forecasted them yet. The one thing I will say to you, if you can take my word for it, because obviously it's not quantitative, is that the responses that we're seeing from early dark energy for the typical sort of, so you, you see where I show uh, back at the start of the presentation, I was talking about these, um, these weighted uh, responses, okay. Um, the I didn't show them because they're not really they're, they're they're good in terms of if you know what the parameters are, but in terms of actual when you're talking about new cosmology, I, I think they they don't really show any of you what, what's actually going on here. Um, it's just more sort of clarity for detectability. But for EDE, the um, if you even for like a lower amplitude of early dark energy you actually see this, um, the amplitude of the early dark energy variations it is much, when it's weighted like this, it's much higher than say um, an effective and Hubble especially, it's much higher than the pair of them. So whilst I don't, I don't necessarily know the numbers um, as of yet, I know that the detectability is gonna be better than what, than when we, what we forecasted for, for an effective. And I think that comes from the fact that it is, um, depending on the way you choose your models it's it's behavior and it's um and the variation on the crr is much less trivial than what you get from an effective you get something a lot like a sort of superposition of two separate uh, effects so yeah we don't have the numbers right now but i know the whatever we get the forecasted errors are definitely going to be better than what we've got for an effective right now um for future spectrometers all right I thank helps. you very much yeah Yes, it's very bad because three words are enough, obviously. But um, uh, we should uh, we should probably move on from from here. Um, and thank Luke again for this very nice, uh, you know, uh, overview of, of of a lot of uh, interesting calculations with recombination lines. Um, uh, I believe Matteo is the next next in line. Yes, please, Matteo, if you want to start sharing. So I hope you can see my screen uh, and course as well. Looks good. So, um, first of all, let me thank Jens and Andrea for the opportunity uh, to present my work today. Um, and uh, as you just said, my name is Matteo Luca. I'm a PhD student at the University of Libre of Brussels. And uh, right now, I would like to talk to you about the, the role that, in my opinion, CMB spectral distortions could play in the context of the Hubble tension. And I will base myself on my paper that I published last summer. But since the results, in my opinion, are very straightforward, I decided to, to give some space to the numerical implementation that I employed to reach those results. And this is largely based on this reference, which was developed in collaboration with Jens, Diana, Julian, and Nils. And uh, I must say, I'm really thankful for the learning experience and uh, for the collaboration in general. But okay, uh, apart from that, let me dive directly into, sorry, directly into uh, the numerical implementation. Uh, we decided to include the calculation of spectral distortions in CLASS. And uh, for those of you that might not know, CLASS is a cosmological Boltzmann solver designed to calculate observables such as the uh, CMB anisotropy power spectra or the matter power spectrum. And it is designed in such a way that you have a chain of modules and each module rely only on the calculations that uh, 
were performed by the previous module so that you, have, uh, you like you have to calculate everything only once and uh, what we did in order to uh, attach so to, to include spectral distortions was to attach two new modules to this chain the first one is the heating right so, so is the heating module and accounts for several sources of spectral distortions. And the second is really actually calculating the derived spectral distortion spectrum. The first one had to be, is almost an appendix to the thermodynamical module because um, many sources of, uh, of spectral distortions also inject energy. And therefore you have to account for them already at the level of the, the matter temperature evolution. While the distortion spectrum is at the very end of this chain because it relies on uh, primordial quantity, thermodynamical and background quantities. Uh, however, I will focus on uh, those features that I think are important in order to understand the final results. Uh, but this is only a part of the huge effort that in my opinion went into the realization of uh, the latest version of class 3.0. So I sorry. So I encourage you to have a look at uh, the official website of the code and at this reference for more details and also for many more references that I haven't had the space physically to fill in the slides. Now, uh, focusing on the heating module, uh, we implemented several uh, sources of spectral distortions and we divided them into two classes. The first one are straightforward energy injection, like it could be the case in dark matter decaying or primordial uh, black hole evaporation. Uh, and those are really important to uh, keep track of already when calculating the um, thermodynamical evolution. Uh, we also have uh, what we call non-injected sources of spectral distortions, and it could, uh, as it could be uh, for the dissipation of acoustic waves and the sinus set of each effect. The adiabatic cooling is just a choice we made to call it non-injected because we wanted to uh, implement it separately. But still, uh, these, however, are only uh, called by the code when uh, the uh, spectral distortion spectrum is required. Now. Uh, among these effects, we try to be as inclusive as, as possible as far as the lambda CDM prediction goes. Uh, but um, for the moment, the cosmic, cosmic or cosmological recombination radiation is uh, not yet implemented, uh, but it's something that we are actively uh, thinking about. And uh, every result that uh, we published and that I'm going to discuss later will only uh, enhance its, uh, let, let's say the role of spectral distortions will only enhance uh, once this effect is also accounted for. As a remark, let me also point out that uh, in the uh, treatment of the energy injections, we also try to be as careful as possible in, uh, in distinguishing between injected and deposited energy, uh, really trying to um, implement different approximation schemes and uh, to, to different degrees of accuracy uh, when trying to um, define the injection efficiency as well as deposition fractions. Um, for instance, when dark matter decays, Part of the energy could go in neutrinos and we have to filter that out and this is something we try to do uh, on last like in the last session you heard much more detailed treatment of the energy injection history but um, this is what we felt was the best we could do now uh, moving on to the uh, distortions module what we did was to as commonly done uh, is to assume that the, that the thermalization problem can be linearized and in this approach, you, you, you make use of Green's function approximation where the uh, spectral distortion spectrum can be divided into, into conceptually different parts. The first one, so the first one is the Green's function, which really tells you how the spectral distortion shape evolves once you inject some energy. And uh, another part, which regardless of the um, precise meaning of these quantities, keeps track of um, the uh, energy injection history, and it's, it, it contains the full cosmology dependence. And in this way, the problem can be really uh, becomes really much more simple because you only well, when um, performing, let's say, uh, expensive computations, you only need to take care of uh, this heating rate while the Green's function is pre-computed. And uh, to that point, I really have to acknowledge the huge work that went into this reference by Jens, uh, and we rely very heavily upon the calculations that uh, he performed already there in order to calculate the Green's function uh, and uh, its decomposition in uh, distortions and uh, branching ratios. Now, one other point that I would like to highlight is the fact that, um, as uh, also uh, found by another paper by Jens and Jeong in 2013, that in order to solve uh, this um, decomposition exactly, you need information from uh, the detector. You need to know what kind of uh, frequency array your detector would have uh, when observing the, um, the 
let's say the, the spectral distortion spectrum. And uh, then you can, via a, a relatively complicated uh, projection procedure, you can calculate the uh, branching ratios and then um, derive uh, constraints on cosmological quantities. Uh, I, to my knowledge, uh, we implemented for the first time in a public code, the possibility to have an absolute freedom in the definition of the detector specifics. So really when you want to do your forecasts, uh, as we did in this uh, Fuetal reference, you can specify whatever detector you would like, and everything is uh, treated in a consistent way, both at the level of class and at the level of um, Monty Python. And um, uh, apropos Monty Python, for those of you that might not know what uh, the code is about, it's a parameter extraction code, which normally calls class several times for different choices of the initial parameters, and then compares the prediction of class to data, like real data, like it could be for, for Planck, sorry, uh, BAO, Pantheon, whatever you like. But uh, it also allows you to perform uh, forecasts when real data doesn't exist. And in this case, uh, you use make use of mock likelihoods, which basically means that you create your own observable, you fix uh, the initial parameters, and we chose lambda CDM with um, Planck values. You create your own speculative distortion spectrum, and then you run your normal MCMC on top of uh, that uh, fiducial. Now, uh, a, a key characteristics of mock likelihoods is that uh, the only meaningful quantities are uh, the uh, uncertainties on the parameters that you are scanning over and not really the uh, absolute values because those are uh, supposed to recover the fiducials that you chose. Uh, as a, another point, uh, it is the foregrounds are really not included, uh, were not included at the stage where I published the paper I will discuss later, but um, they are right now in the uh, Monte Python version that will hopefully be made public as soon as possible. It is unfortunately out of my hands, but um, I expect it to happen very soon. Nevertheless, we, we discuss uh, our implementation in this Schoenberg et al. reference, and again, we largely base um, our treatment on uh, this Abitual et al. reference. Uh, so really what we try to do is to combine several codes to include them in this much more uh, general setup of class uh, in order to account for speculative distortions and explore the synergy that speculative distortions could have with uh, CNMB and isotopy data as well as other data sets. Uh, now, coming to the core of the presentation, uh, let me uh, try to address uh, the role that speculative distortions could play in the context of the Hubble tension. And, uh, to do that, uh, let me first of all remark the fact that there is growing consensus around the idea that uh, for a solution to double tension to be su successful, it needs to modify the expansion history of the universe just prior to recombination. In particular, just a couple of redshift, a uh, couple of decades in redshift prior to recombination. And it is often the case that the new physics introduced by the model needs to be compensated by significant shifts in the lambda CDM parameters in order to preserve like, the goodness of the fit to CMB and isotropy data. And the reason for this is that, um, also linking to uh, Luke's talk before, uh, the case of, say, uh, uh, early dark energy, you have a spike in uh, the uh, energy density just prior to recombination, and you want to boil down to lambda CDM just in time uh, not to spoil uh, the CMB. So what happens is that uh, this increase in, in uh, energy density needs to be compensated by, for instance, a tilt in the spectrum. And, uh, and this would mean that these models introduce very strong degeneracies with uh, model specific parameters and uh, for say the scalar spectral index. And if that's the case, then spectral distortions are well known to be able to place strong bounds on the scalar spectral index. And they could, could thereby test the model's ability to address the Hubble tension, even if the model itself does not predict any non-standard um, Spectral distortion, standard source of spectral distortions. You really only rely on the lambda CDM prediction as far as uh, sources of spectral distortions and on the fact that many models try to extend the parameter space uh, allowed for NS. And you can pinpoint the value of NS that you would want to try to understand whether the model is actually able to address the above tension. And uh, I'm very thankful to- Five minutes. So yeah, thank you to Luke for introducing early dark energy and doing all the hard work. So I di I'll dive directly into the matter of fact. And early dark energy is indeed an example of uh, a possibility uh, to which you could apply this idea. And here, I, as you can see, the fraction of early dark energy comes into play with strong degeneracies with H0, the dark matter energy density, and uh, as expected, the uh, scanner spectral index. And so what I did was to 
uh, in this plot isolate the uh, subplots where the, these degeneracies are present and compare the lambda CDM prediction in red to the early dark energy contours in blue for real data from Planck, BAO, Pantheon, and um, shoes. And as you can see, uh, the energy can uh, nicely solve the double tension. And then if you add spectral distortions on top of these probes, assuming lambda CDM as a fiducial, you see that spectral distortions act as a very strong prior on an S, and they ultimately break the, the degeneracy that this parameter shares with a fraction of early dark energy and indirectly limits the model, model's ability to go up in each knot to the point where the model is no longer able to successfully address the double tension. However, as I told you here, we are assuming lambda CDM, but it's just as likely that spectral distortions would observe a much higher value of an S, say, in this region, and they would thereby provide an even stronger evidence in favor of early dark energy. Now, early dark energy is something, uh, is a model uh, I assumed as a proof of principle because it's very successful, but this is by no means the only example this idea could be applied to. And indeed, some interesting applications of neutrino physics. And here, regardless of the specifics of the model here, uh, I'm showing a plot from uh, Archidiacono et al. Uh, you see here in the subplot where uh, you, 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 you explore H0 and NS, that there is a clear degeneracy and again, spectral distortions in this context could really help you um, understand whether this model is access, could be a successful solution to the double tension or not. There are also the model like self-interacting neutrinos, although these are becoming more and more disfavored uh, due to uh, polarization data, as well as interacting myron neutrinos. And this is, in my opinion, a very exci exciting avenue. And so uh, I encourage you to have a look at this paper. Uh, there are also possibility uh, towards mod modified gravity. This is taken by um, uh, the, the talk by Javier uh, only yesterday at this very same um, meeting. And here you see that, uh, for instance, for uh, brain sticker uh, modifications of general relativity, uh, you can solve the double tension. And this comes with an increased value of an S so that again, you would, and this is consistent uh, over these many modules. So, you can really apply this model to a variety of models, even if, so this idea to a variety of models, even if they not, do not predict any spectral distortions themselves. Now, this is the, what I meant to say during my presentation and then coming to my summary, the take home messages I would like you to, to remember is that um, very soon we will have a, a complete class and Monte Python implementation public. And this comes with uh, state-of-the-art features such as uh, the inclusion of many uh, standard and exotic sources of spectral distortions. Uh, we, only missing the, we are only missing the cosm cosmological recombination radiation, but we are actively thinking about uh, implementing that. Um, we are solving uh, the thermalization problem exactly, uh, and we allow for a total freedom the choice of the detector setting, which allow for um, really uh, realistic um, forecasts for uh, eventual future missions. And the fact that we also have galactic and extragalactic foregrounds accounted for makes the forecast even more realistic. Uh, as far as the uh, role of spectral distortions in the context of the apple tension goes, the idea is very simple. The spectral distortions are well known to be able to play strong bounds on an S. And if a model significantly affects this parameter in the attempt to solve the apple tension, then spectral distortions would be a really important probe to test it, to really test its ability to go up or not in H0. And with that, uh, I think I thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to any question you might have. Thank you. Perfect timing, Luca. Thanks, uh, Matteo. Thanks a lot uh, for, your, for your nice talk. Uh, a round of applause, please. And, and Boris has, um, has a question already. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering in the green fun function uh, projection, there you have to integrate the um, energy release over uh, the visibility, visibility functions. Uh, those visibility functions, um, I think Jens has computed them. I don't remember whether there is some significant cosmology dependence in those visibility functions, which may have to be taken into account when it, when we explore uh, varying cosmologies in class, for instance? Yeah, uh, w this is a, a, a really good question. And uh, I really promised myself to say almost cosmology independent, but I realized just now that <laughs> I forgot. So 
<laughs> Thank you very much for pointing that out. Uh, indeed, uh, this is something I personally, uh, I, I would like to explore very soon. And uh, I, I assume there, depending on uh, the way you define uh, the, um, so this is a tabled um, function. And uh, then in principle, you construct the branching vanishes out of uh, this Green's function. And the point is that you can define these green functions either in terms of redshift, and this would make your table cosmology dependent, or you could define it in terms of um, the amplitude of the distortion. So that in principle, when you uh, run your cosmology, you can uh, use the amplitude of the distortions as a proxy for the evolution and use that, and that would make the, um, the Green's function uh, approach, I, I would say, not at all cosmology dependent. But uh, I, as I said, this is something I've only uh, superficially thought about. I will have to think more about it, but uh, there is certainly a way to make it cosmology independent. The way it is right now, it's not, but it's also uncertain the extent to which it actually matters. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank I you for the question. question. But I will. Uh, right to you maybe yeah yeah colin oh, colin right. i saw your hand go up yeah just very quickly i was wondering if you could explain in a little bit more detail what you mean by the dependence on the detector specifics here because yeah. i would normally think that if i have some energy release history i can compute what the y distortion the mu distortion and so on is so in what sense is there any dependence on the detector specifics in this physical quantity of interest yeah thank you very much for the question so uh <laughs> This is something that uh, I personally feel it's a, a very delicate point. And uh, again, I thank you for the question. Uh, the idea here is to me is that, um, uh, let me try to, so the point is that you only have access to, uh, uh, okay, let me try to phrase it another way. There are two ways to define Y and mu. The first one is using more advanced codes, like it would be the full Cosmo term, and others are just using fitting parameters, such it would be the case for, uh, when, when fires. For fires, Y and mu are just manually fitting parameters and they have not really a connection to the physics because they do not take into account uh, residuals, etc. So if you want to, and in the two uh, definitions of Y and mu are, in my opinion, incompatible because they are not comparing the same um, quantities. If you take fires, you have a limited frequency array and uh, the way you define Y and mu, it's it's not disentangling uh, perfectly the degeneracies that are between Y and mu. So your parameters are not really the same as uh, the, uh, the, one, the actual one you would compute with a Cosmo term. So what we do is to define Y and mu as you would observe them and not as, uh, as they would uh, be calculated using Cosmo term. And for that, you need information from the detector. So we really want to be experimental, ex experiment focused and try to compare it to that rather than to the actual uh, Y and mu, which are indeed physical, but uh, let's say, uh, they, they, okay. Uh, I would love to discuss it about, more, about it more during the discussion later, uh, if, you, if you are interested, because also there is another point about the fact that the only quantity that actually means something uh, is the, the total spectrum, Y and mu are just parameterization. So what we do is we actually focus on that and not Y and mu simply to avoid exactly these ambiguities in the definition. But I am aware that there is only a limited amount of time for the answers. And uh, I hope that this sort of answers your question. Okay, yeah, yeah, we could maybe discuss more later. Yeah, I, I would love yeah. it, thank you very much. I think that's a, that's a good idea. Thanks a lot for, for the questions and thanks again, uh, again Matteo, for your nice talk. Um, Yasin should be the next speaker if I'm if I'm not um, off. I believe yes. Yasin, please. Um, oh, very good. Take it away. Can you all hear me? Okay. Now we can. Yes. Let me start my time so I can also. Okay. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Uh, I wish it had been in person, but we'll do what we can. Okay. So I'll tell you uh, briefly about this work on testing particle dark matter interactions through CMB spectral distortions. And this is based on these three papers. The original idea was laid out in this first paper. 
which we wrote with Jens and Mark Minkowski uh, six years ago now, and then I'm going to tell you on the latest updates. As a general introduction, dark matter we know is, is ubiquitous and manifests itself across a very broad range of scales from dwarf galaxies to galaxies to clusters of galaxies, large tail structure, and all the way to the cosmic microwave background. And in fact, our best measurement of the amount of dark matter comes from CMB anisotropies. Okay? This is just to illustrate that if you try to reduce the amount of dark matter, uh, then you completely misfit by a large amount is very precisely measured CMB temperature and polarization power spectrum. Okay, so the existence and amount of dark matter is a very well established fact. We know how much there is within a percent, but of course the big question is what on earth is actually dark matter? And there are many, many different kinds of candidates with very broad uh, different classes of candidates as illustrated here. So what I will focus on in this talk is a very, it's a subclass of phenomenology of uh, dark matter, namely as the question, what if dark matter has some kind of feeble electromagnetic interactions? Could we detect this? So those could come, for example, if dark matter can scatter elastically with either photons or electrons or nuclear. I mean, they would come at the fundamental level if dark matter is some particle which has, who's, which has interactions at the fundamental level with uh, any of the standard model particles. So this would lead phenomenologically to either elastic scattering or annihilations or decays, as we've heard in a couple of the talks. Or another very different class could be injection of uh, electromagnetically interacting particles from primordial black holes, whether they evaporate or accrete. So all of these things, as we've heard, they can be tested through spectral distortions. But what I'm going to be focusing on this talk is the very first one, namely the elastic scattering of dark matter particles with photons, electrons, or nuclei. So as a prelude, elastic scattering of dark matter is uh, something that is tested very strongly by direct detection experiments. Okay, so direct detection experiments look, for example, for dark matter nucleon. Uh, interactions. And so they look for the small recoil that dark matter can impart to nucleons and big tanks of um, noble gases. Now, these direct detection experiments are extremely sensitive in some ranges of masses, but for uh, two light dark matter particles, they lose sensitivity. So namely for dark matter baryon scattering, if the dark matter mass is less than about a GeV or so, then as you can see, for example, in this plot, so this is some uh, limits on some cross-section of dark matter with protons as a function of dark matter mass. These direct detection experiments can probe heavy dark matter particles, but then they lose sensitivity on light dark matter particles. This is uh, also the case if you look for dark matter electron scattering. So there you look for the effect of dark matter that might, that might uh, ionize or excite uh, atoms. And these direct, these direct detection experiments lose sensitivity for dark matter masses below an MeV or so. Okay, so it's, a, it's very important to try and complement direct detection experiments uh, for searches for dark matter with cosmological and astrophysical probes. Okay, so for example, CMB anisotropies can also uh, probe dark matter scattering with protons, okay, with, with baryons in general. So those are just illustrating some limits which were derived by different groups on the dark matter proton uh, cross-section, elastic cross-section as a function of dark matter mass. And again, these bands here are direction detection limits. And you see that CMB limits can go to the lighter masses where direct detection limits uh, are not sensitive. So in this talk, I'm gonna be telling you about how spectral distortions can also probe uh, this process. So I will, in one single slide, and I apologize to Jans and Rashid and all of those who have worked on this for many years, going to summarize the absolute essential that you need for spectral distortion physics for this talk, so uh, which was already summarized in multiple talks. So the basic idea is that at redshifts greater than about 2 million, meaning time less than about two months after the Big Bang, photons are easily created and destroyed through thermal interactions with the plasma, through Bremschandling and double, um, double Compton scattering. And as a consequence, whatever energy you inject into the plasma at these times, gets fully thermalized, you get a perfect black body spectrum, possibly with a different temperature. Um, at lower redshifts, after two months after the Big Bang, the photon number is no longer conserved, is no longer, sorry, easily changed. So photon number is now conserved. And furthermore, at redshift less than 60 or 50,000 or so, uh, photon energy is uh, no longer easily changed. 
So that means that whatever energy you inject might actually distort the uh, spectrum of the CMB. The exact shape of the distortion, as we heard from the previous talk, will of course depend on exactly when and what is the kind of uh, the type, the way that you inject energy in the spectrum. But as a rough estimate, the fractional distortion to the CMB spectrum is of order of the integral over time, starting at rate of 2 million, of the energy injected per unit time per unit volume divided by the energy density in photons. Okay, and we can formalize this with the Green's function uh, that were mentioned in the previous talk uh, that Jens uh, has calculated. So the status now, uh, again, I'm, I'm repeating this, I'm sorry if it's was still said many times, is that these FIRAS has measured these distortions to be less than 10 minus four or so. And of course, the hope is that there are several uh, instruments that might measure them to much better sensitivity. So it's interesting to ask whether uh, these could probe dark matter baryon scatter or dark matter properties in general. So let's just start briefly to mention dark matter annihilation and how uh, spectral distortions are sensitive to dark matter annihilations. So if you have a dark matter particle that annihilates with some cross section sigma, so this gives you the uh, sigma v times number density of dark matter squared gives you the annihilation rate per unit volume. And this gives you the energy uh, injection rate per unit volume. If you plug this into this integral that I was just mentioning, we can compute the spectral distortion. And what you can show is that if you have a constant sigma v, so a so-called S-wave annihilation cross section, you will find the mu distortion to be four times n minus 10 if sigma v over m chi this parameter here saturates CMB and isotropy upper limits. So for specifically S-wave annihilations, uh, CMB spectral distortions are not competitive with CMB and isotropies, but they could be for P-wave annihilations. Okay, if this sigma v is uh, actually a function of velocity, thus of temperature. All right, and the same thing actually is true for accreting parameter line. So basically, if you inject energy in a way that might uh, mess up recombination, typically you're more sensitive to recombination uh, or, you, or you need to have a very, very sensitive measurement of spectral distortions to be competitive with uh, the limits from recombination. All right. Now, the story is different for dark matter scatter. So let me tell you how this works. That was the basic idea behind this. So suppose we have a non-relativistic dark matter particle. So starting at rate of 2 million, if we ask that the dark matter temperature is less than the temperature of the plasma, that means that we require this whole process, this whole calculation works only for dark matter masses heavier than about a keV or so, okay? So if your dark matter particle is non-relativistic, its temperature would decay as one over a scale factor squared. So T chi dot for adiabatic expansion would go as minus two times Hubble times T chi. On the other hand, the photons and the baryons and plasma in general, which are thermally coupled, their temperature goes as one over A, so T gamma dot goes as minus H times T gamma. Now imagine that the dark matter scatters either directly with the photons or with the electrons, which themselves are coupled to the photons, or with the protons, which themselves are coupled to the electrons, thus to the photons, okay? So this elastic scattering would generate an exchange of heat, okay? So if the cross-section is large enough, at some point, Early enough, the dark matter will be initially thermally coupled to the plasma, if up to down to some decoupling redshift. And by the way, this process is identical to what happens in the standard universe with baryons. So down to some decoupling redshift, the dark matter temperature would actually be tightly coupled to the photon baryon temperature. Okay, so in terms of baryons and photons, this decoupling redshift would be about 200. In terms of dark matter, this decoupling redshift will depend on the cross-section of dark matter with whatever standard model particle it scatters with. Okay, so this means that the actual temperature evolution differs from this adiabatic evolution. So this means that dark matter is constantly being heated up by the plasma. Therefore, it is extracting heat from the plasma. And the rate of energy injection is negative and is just three halves of the number density of dark matter particles times the difference between the actual temperature evolution minus the adiabatic temperature evolution. And so as long as dark matter is tightly coupled with the plasma, this gives you a three halves of number density of dark matter particles times H T gamma. 
And so the key here is that this energy injection rate is inversely proportional to the mass of the dark matter particles because it cares about the number density of dark matter particles. So if you plug this into this spectral distortion integral, and again, you can do this more accurately by using Green's functions, the bottom line is that you're going to find that the spectral distortion, be it the mu distortion or the y distortion, depending on what uh, time, time you're considering, is going to be inversely proportional again to the is going to be basically proportional to the ratio of the number density of dark matter particles to the number density of photons. Five, five minutes, Yasin. All right. And so it is going to be inversely proportional to the mass of dark matter particle times some logarithm, which depends on the decoupling redshift. And this decoupling redshift is determined such that the rate of scattering or the rate of heat exchange uh, falls below the Hubble rate. So using this very simple uh, approximation and the simple instantaneous decoupling approximation, we estimated the spectral distortion, thus upper limits from FIRAS on dark matter proton, electron, and photon, as well as forecasted sensitivity to pixie uh, in this first paper. But it turns out that this instantaneous decoupling approximation was very wrong. And let me tell you why. So first, let me tell you why we made this approximation. So if dark matter scatters with itself very quickly, then it will have a maxwell boltzmann velocity distribution. So then to follow this whole thermal exchange process, all you need to do is solve for an ordinary differential equation, namely the evolution of the temperature. But if dark matter does not scatter with itself quickly, then it, once it stops scattering with whatever plasma particle it scatters with, with once it falls out of equilibrium, in general, you need to follow its full velocity distribution rather than just assume it's maxwell boltzmann so lacking a detailed treatment of this velocity distribution, at the time, we simply made the simple approximation of instantaneous decoupling. Now, a couple of years ago, I actually went ahead and made a, an approximate calculation of solving the evolution of dark matter velocity distribution. So what I did here is I approximated the, the collision operator by the fusion operator by finding the, uh, the uh, exact uh, diffusion uh, Fokker Planck operator that would get the correct diffusion uh, rate. And what you find here is that the rate of heat exchange varies from the assumption of Maxwell Boltzmann by up to a factor of two, but it's no more than a factor of two. So the bottom line is that if you're okay with order unity accuracy, you can assume Maxwell Boltzmann and you can just solve for your evolution of the temperature. Okay? You might have order unity errors, but no more than order unity. And when you do so, what happens is that, so here I'm showing is a function of redshift for a specific dark matter candidate. If you made the, the instantaneous decoupling approximation, it would decouple, in this case, at redshift 50,000. But if you actually follow its temperature evolution, there is a residual heat long after the official decoupling time, and in such a way that you have a large distortion, okay, in this case. So the bottom line is that the chemical potential distortion or any distortion here, as you crank up the cross section, actually has some significant. Uh, part here for low cross sections and light masses, which means that you can actually get much stronger limits uh, and probe much more sensitively the cross section for light dark matter masses. So I uh, recalculated fire ice constraints and um, spectral and the uh, forecast for different spectral distortion experiments for different cross sections of dark matter with protons, electrons, scaling differently with, with velocities. You can see all of this in the paper. And also for fun, I considered a specific dark matter model, which would be say if dark matter is parameterized with some electric or magnetic dipole moment, in which case for a single parameter, you can predict all the cross sections, annihilations into photons, leptons, and anti-leptons, and scattering with photons, scattering with electrons and nuclei. All this from a single parameter. And then you can ask, what are the limits on this single parameter? Basically, the dipole of the, di the dark matter, either electric or magnetic. And so this is just to show you the last plot here, that if you compare the forecasted sensitivity of even a, a distortion experiment sensitive to 10 minus 9, unfortunately, for this specific model, it is never more sensitive than the most existing sensitive constraints. Okay, It can be sensi more sensitive than some constraints in every mass range, but it's never more sensitive than the most sensitive constraints. Okay, but this is one specific dark matter model. Okay, if you uh, wanted to test more, I have made this little code publicly available. So this code will take a parameterized, um, a set of parameterized cross sections for dark matter with 
protons, photons, electrons, and annihilation, cross-section, et cetera, and then can calculate the spectral distortion using uh, the Green's functions uh, responses from Jens and uh, com compute uh, some upper limits or forecasts. And I think I'm 30 seconds over, so I'll stop here. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Yasin, for this very nice talk. Let's uh, give a round of applause. Unmute. Andrea, you didn't unmute. Um, anyway, uh, great. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, as I said. And um, I see Mathieu has a question. Yes, thank you for the very pedagogical talk. Um, I have a, it's a general question. So let's suppose that we detect a, a mu distortions with future observations. I'm wondering how do we know that which, what, what is the source of this, uh, this mu distortions? How, how do we know that it is due to dark matter annihilations and not to dissipation of uh, small scale acoustic modes? Uh, if it produces the same shape of distortions, how we will be able to disentangle the source of uh, the distortion? Okay, so if it is a, first of all, if it's a negative new distortion, then, and if it's larger than, you know, 10 minus nine, which is what you expect from uh, baryon cooling, then you know it's not from so small scale dissipation. Okay. Uh, and this effect that I'm talking about, I should have clarified it, it's a negative new distortion because it's a cooling of the photon baryon plasma. So this is already a pick unique to, to, Right. To this uh, physics, okay. Yeah. And I don't know the... any other effects would cause a negative new distortion besides the baryon. Uh, photon injection. Photon injection, okay. Yeah, you can you can when you inject uh, sufficiently um, early and at sufficiently low frequencies, you can in principle add more entropy than than energy, and then you can get negative. Um, so then, in this case, yeah, much is but, but, valid. I don't know how but, one would distinguish between. You need to have more but, than one, one single parameter, obviously. Yeah, but 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 the first thing to state is if we see uh, if we see a mu distortion that's different from lambda CDM prediction, we already have a this proof of lambda CDM, which is like great. But then the question of answering what is causing it is is requiring, in principle, to go to the R-type distortions and so on. And the energy release history that Yassine was calculating for his models will be different uh, in general from uh, distortion energy release coming from the small scale power, for example. So you, you are having, in principle, fundamentally speaking, you have a way to distinguish. But um, yeah, yes, uh, Boris, you are asking as well. Yes, thank you. Um, in the beginning of the talk, you mentioned uh, when you were um, talking about the annihilation cases that spectral distortions were not competitive with an CMB anisotropic constraint. That's right. For for a S wave annihilation cross section, yes. But is that not uh, also a statement that is mass dependent or lifetime dependent? So for for annihilation, I'll show you the slide again. Uh, uh, it's 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 just sensitive to this sigma sigma v over m chi, so it's independent. This both both CMB and isotropies uh, and spectral distortions are just sensitive to this because they're both sensitive to the energy injection rates. Yes, but at different times. No. Right. So so if so here I've just done it for the mu distortion. It's true. I've just done it for the mu distortion. Uh, so I haven't done it for the y distortion. I see. But I suspect, it, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the, the, the energy release history is basically logarithmic and redshift for, for the standard S wave annihilation. And if you inject that amount of energy during recombination, you get a big response because of ions uh, reacting to it. Right, but right, the so photons, you have, to, you have to play, you have to fight against the photons. This, this, this point is, is something that, that, that was made many times, yeah. Um, okay. Is the constant sigma v? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, for P wave, you have a possibility to have early energy release. Great. Um, uh, if is there any other question? We 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 are a little late in terms of our planned schedule, but I think uh, we have we have one more talk now, and then maybe we we. I was thinking maybe we can even do a small um, you know screenshot. Everybody switches on this their uh, camera, and we can take a screenshot at the end. But um, let's thank, uh, before we, we do that, let's thank Yasin again one more time. And then uh, Bruno, I think you're the last speaker now.
Good afternoon. Uh, okay, here's my presentation. Hope you can see it. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So uh, thank you uh, to give me the opportunity to present this uh, this uh, study uh, that we call Bizu. Um, this is a, a study for uh, balloon born a potential balloon born experiment that might be able to do uh, the measurement of a CMD spectral distortion or at least some of them. Um, and uh, there's already a regrouping. Uh, a wide range of uh, expertise from uh, Europe, uh, and the US and, and Japan as well. Uh, so, oops, I, okay. Um, I'm not gonna dwell on, on the science. I think that uh, a lot of people have already uh, done that for me uh, and far better that I could do. Uh, so uh, I just remind you that, of course, that uh, since uh, the, the, the measurement from uh, Kobe Faras uh, in uh, 92, there hasn't been any other um, measurement of the CMB spectrum, uh, detailed at least. And uh, that's what we will need to do if we want to do uh, the measurement of the spectral distortion. Um, and as I said, uh, uh, I'm not going to dwell on that. There's, uh, there's various type of, of uh, distortion that you can imagine. Uh, and uh, I will refer to you to the previous talk and, and notably the, the one from the first uh, on Tuesday uh, from June. Um, if we are talking about uh, spectral measurement um, and over a wide band uh, of, uh, of uh, frequency, Probably the, the best instrument we have to be a, what we call a Fourier transform spectrometer. Um, that will be able to cover a wide range uh, of, uh, of frequencies. And the thing is that with this type of instrument, the, 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 big, uh, the big issue is that you receive a full, the full amount of, uh, of photons, the, all the photons with power on the detector at some point. And uh, so you have to integrate, you have to know your, your sign the signal that you're looking at, uh, as we see not only from the sky, but also at any other source of, of photons. And that will define of, uh, or, um, of uh, background on the detector. And you see that uh, uh, from this picture that shows uh, the, the foregrounds that we can think of. Uh, from the synchrotron to free free to the cosmic infrared background, uh, zodiac dust, the anomalies, microwave emission, and even including astrogatic zero. The only thing that I haven't plotted, uh, we haven't plotted here, is uh, the actual CMB in a sense. Uh, so that if you add all that, uh, you have uh, all the, the total signal that uh, from the sky that you, you will need to take into account on your detector. So that's uh, in, integrity in that, that a lot of photons and a lot of power. Now, um, if you relate that to um, the, the signal we want to, to measure, and here I, is again, um, the work that has been uh, published before by uh, Max a bit more and then uh, one of our students is, is working on that, adding more uh, effects in a sense. So you taking back the total sky signal and you look at the relative um, uh, um, power that this um, uh, distortion will emit, the emission of the spectral distortion relatively to the total sky signal. And you see that you have uh, uh, several order of magnitude, uh, no, uh, not only even on the delta T, on the uh, black body distortion or CMB black body distortion, but also uh, if you try to measure the either the non relativistic or relativistic uh, white distortion, or even further for the mu distortion. Um, so that has been uh, you know uh, presented several times. Uh, in, for, uh, from uh, various speakers. So what's, uh, what are the, uh, uh, the experiments that have been trying to be proposed, to only proposed to, to, to do that, this uh, type of measurement? So uh, I guess all of you have heard about PIXI, which was uh, 
submitted to NASA uh, by Al Kogat et al. in uh, 2017 uh, as a medium mission. Then there was uh, a, a European uh, push on, uh, to do that with a, a, a mission uh, called Pristine, which was proposed as a F mission, one of these new type of mission from ESA in 2018. Um, that has become uh, became even more trendy lately with uh, the the release of papers, the white papers uh, uh, that uh, are mentioned here, and uh, with the outcome of the of the of the ESA uh, voyage uh, 2050. So uh, obviously the science case is there. It's it's it's, it's it, it is established now. How are we going to do that? How can how are we going to do these measurements? Uh, these two missions that have been proposed, uh, the, they haven't been selected uh, mainly on the ground of uh, the feasibility uh, from a hardware point of view. The concept uh, uh, has been, you know, it's not, hasn't been just mature enough to be proposed, uh, to be uh, realized in, in a sense, or to be accepted as a uh, phase A study. Um, and also the systematics of this type of instrument is not well, are not well known, not known enough to, to be sure that uh, uh, these measurements are going to be doable. So uh, taking all that into account uh, and before going to a, a, a larger mission in the context of the, of the 2050 uh, ESA voyage, uh, um, we thought that uh, a scope, uh, there is a scope for Pathfinder in between. Um, so this Python that will have to improve the maturity of the instrument concept, that would be a good step forward to then to propose it for, for a future mission. Uh, well, we want to do science. So obviously uh, the, the, the minimum target would be to, to try to detect uh, the white parameter and some secondary science, I will come back to that. And also the main issue is to understand the, the associated systematic for this type of instrument. Uh, images are well known uh, now. Uh, so we know what's, uh, what are the, the suspected associated uh, uh, systematics, but for uh, an FTS, this is much more difficult. So what could we do uh, from a balloon platform? And that is the, the, the main topic of this Bizu concept is that would propose that to CNES to do a phase zero study, uh, see if it's viable, can we get some preliminary science and to improve the technology. So uh, coming back to the Pixie or slash pristine concept, uh, all that is uh, uh, based on a Fourier transform spectrometer um, with two inputs. We are trying to do a, a, a differential measurement, so an absolute uh, spectrum with different modes, one mode to measure the polarization of the CMB, uh, two parts of the sky that we uh, differentiate, or having a calibrator uh, at the same temperature of the CMB and do a measurement versus a spectrum uh, measurement versus a calibrator, one known calibrator, to do the, the, uh, the spectral distortion measurements. So these are the, the, the main, uh, the classic, uh, um, uh, specification that we would like to have for this type of, of, uh, of concept. Trying to have a range of frequency, uh, probably larger than that, but let's try to be realistic. Something between 60 gigahertz up to two or slash six terahertz. Uh, a certain bandwidth, uh, and then there's a, some uh, optimization to do around that, but uh, both of the instruments were targeting about 50 uh, 15 gigas bandwidth and uh, very low temperature detector to have the sensitivity. So these are the main uh, the main characteristics of such an instrument. Uh, trying to do both uh, uh, polarization and uh, CMB polarization uh, for B modes and and uh, spectral distortion. Now, for uh, our Bizu consortium. Uh, Let's try to do what we could do as a Pathfinder for these missions and what kind of instruments we can develop. Uh, so what would I, obviously we don't claim that we're gonna do as good as, as, a, as a, a, a space mission, but what science can we do at least? 
the first uh, uh, thing that we would like to have is uh, at least to have a detection of white type distortion. Um, but not only that, uh, if we have the sensitivity to do that, we have also sensitivity to do a measurement of uh, cosmic infrared background, for instance, and also to improve the knowledge of the emission of the dust that to then help all the also uh, help all the projects, CMB project like Lightbird, for instance, to uh, remove these effects. Uh, so what we need to do then is to adapt this concept and see uh, how they will fit on the balloon platform and what are the, the specificity of a balloon platform. And ideally what we want to do is to prepare a proposal to have a phase A uh, detailed study for future balloon. So um, the first step is uh, what we have um, at our disposal in a sense. Uh, Five minutes. Okay, uh, so uh, we're starting with a gondola with uh, these uh, kind of characteristics uh, and trying to target potentially a five day flight. Uh, so there is mass and, uh, and power consumption uh, uh, restrictions um, and we have to fit within the volume. So these are the main thing, but uh, there's two additional problems, main problems that are the residual atmosphere, even if at 40 kilometers altitude, um, it is uh, very small, but still there is a residual atmosphere. And the fact that we will need some additional components that will create a, a, a much higher background that we could get uh, on, on, on the space mission. So uh, again, we're gonna focus, restrict to what we want, spectral distortion, for the moment, we, we forget uh, CMB, uh, B, po, uh, B mode uh, detection. Let's focus on spectral distortion and simplify the design whenever possible. Sometimes it might not be feasible, but uh, let's try. And for that, we need to assess the systematics in simplifying the design as well. Uh, we want a fixed calibrator to do measurement, uh, spectral measurement versus that. Uh, and uh, all our calculations are taking a five-day flight uh, uh, um, uh, assumption. So we explore the various parameters and we, we need to take into account uh, some things that are specific to balloon. So one of the things that I, I want to show you is the effect of the, even the residual atmosphere. Uh, if you look at the background, or this is, is quite high uh, relatively to what we are trying to measure. Uh, we're gonna have this background. Uh, we, there's nothing to, to do about it. There's not enough knowledge on the, on the atmosphere modeling uh, and the fact that it will vary to really uh, remove that just by model. So uh, we need uh, some sort of uh, atmosphere modulator in, in order to, to subtract this, this effect. The other two, uh, the other two things that uh, would make our life difficult uh, that you, everything will have to be cooled, of, of course. There is a, some residual uh, atmosphere, pressure, and therefore all that has to be enclosed, not like a, a, a space instrument. So you need your window and you need some filters. These are will be at a certain temperature and we have a certain emissivity, uh, radiating power that will again go onto our detector. So if you look at the sensitive calculation, starting from the lowest part here, which is from a, a space uh, mission, you look at what could be achieved on a five day uh, mission, for instance. And in this case, we can measure Y parameter. However, if you start to include all the components like the windows, for instance, not even take into the account of the atmosphere, you see that depending on the temperature of the window and the filters and the emissivity, different uh, uh, assumptions, then uh, you start to be limited in, in, the, in, the, in the sensitivity. So what you do is you calculate the background, you calculate the photon noise limited NAP, and from that you calculate your sensitivity. And then uh, assuming some prior, you can see if you can get the parameters you want or, or not. So here are just a few plots to show you the sensitivity uh, to uh, the, the detection of the Y parameter on uh, some assumptions fixing 
the lowest uh, frequency to 60 gigahertz, and having a look at changing the maximum frequency limit, uh, what will have the impact uh, of, for instance, a window with an, an emissivity of one, uh, 0.1% or 3 times to the minus 4 uh, versus the window temperature. You see that to get uh, typically a signal to noise uh, ratio uh, on the Y parameter of 3, then obviously you need to limit uh, the frequency range up to maybe one terahertz and to cool down the window. That's uh, if, if you have a, a different emissivity that can be relaxed. So that is uh, the, the, the type of, uh, uh, of uh, calculation that are, we are looking at at the moment to try to, to see what is needed. The same type of uh, exercise can be done for de uh, detecting delta T uh, uh, on the, uh, the parameter delta T on the CMB uh, spectrum. You see that in this case, what you might want is to extend the frequency range, uh, which in this case, you will get uh, uh, the, the sing a higher signal to noise ratio. Or again, you can do that with uh, detecting the C uh, temperature of the CIB. Uh, and in this case, due to the, sp the spectrum of the CMB, obviously you want to extend the frequency even further. Um, so that means that we will have, need to have a trade-off between the parameters we want to uh, detect and the parameters of the experiment. So uh, what is going on at the moment? So we are looking at this uh, these, uh, study. This is a phase zero study. Then we're not talking about the balloon yet. Okay, this is just a study if it, to see if it's viable uh, from a balloon platform. Uh, some of the results I've shown here is to look at uh, the frequency range and the various uh, parameters of this uh, concept. What we need to do is to um, include the, the atmosphere into our uh, calculation, how to mitigate the, uh, the effect of the atmosphere. Uh, have a look at the, the, the optimum observation strategy, which is different from a balloon or, or on a space mission, obviously. Um, uh, and uh, so that is uh, ongoing for this phase zero. And at the end of this phase zero, that's supposed to be at the end of this year, early 2022, if we see that it is feasible, uh, that uh, we can meet some science goal, uh, then uh, we propose uh, a, uh, we build a proposal uh, to CNES or other funding agency by 2022 to get a phase A study detailed at that time to, de to really detail the, the instrument concept uh, with hopefully, I would say, in this case, uh, trying to develop uh, a real balloon experiment by let's say 2025 with a tentative uh, first flight in let's say 2026. And that will stop here, thank you. Thanks a lot, Bruno. Let's uh, unmute and give a round of applause. Very good. Um, some questions for Bruno directly. Jack. Um, yes, Bruno. So uh, if I understand correctly, you have taken into account various options for the optical elements to compute the sensitivity. And, and so you take into account the extra loading Yes, indeed. But, so, so my question is, have you done anything in terms of modeling the frequency dependence of the emission and the absorption of the various optical elements? Because they would contribute either foregrounds or um, generate spectral distortions because of frequency dependent uh, absorption. Um, how well can we model that? Did you have a look at that? Uh, well, well, obviously, uh, you know, uh, I've been working with the people in Cardiff that are uh, very knowledgeable on that, and we have our model. So we're trying to have uh, uh, some, uh, you know, together with measurement on these uh, uh, optical uh, elements, uh, and we have also some models. So we start to understand these are very, uh, these calculations at the moment are very, um, I would say, simplified. Now we can see, uh, at least to, for the calculation of sensitivity, 
to get something better is not going to change much. What you are aiming to is that how well can we um, model that to then, um, um, if we have data, how we're going to remove that. Um, obviously, uh, that will be part also of the calibration of the sensor. I haven't had time to speak about it, but one of the main thing for this instrument will be to do a very extremely good calibration. And a lot of emphasis will have to be done on that, not only at the overall instrument, but component by component so that you can disentangle all these effects on the data. I'm not sure I've, good. I've yeah. uh, answered your question. Yeah, but partly I think, uh, yeah. And it, of, of course, these are things which must be taken into account. Because if we want, I was thinking for a future satellite also, if we want to go to 10 to the minus 10, it means that we need to model the transmission at, at that level if we don't have a symmetric, uh, completely symmetric uh, setup. Yeah, uh, at that level, we rely more on measurement than modeling, I would say. So that's the reason why I say calibration is the key. Yes, 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 Ag agreed, yeah. Boris? Maybe one more question. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, first, thank you very much. Uh, what is the current strategy regarding uh, the removal of the atmospheric um, component? And uh, on, in this forecasted sensitivity calculations, what was assumed regarding uh, atmospheric component? On that, uh, okay, so as I said, on, on, on the sensitivity calculation, we haven't taken into account the, the atmosphere yet. So that's, uh, and that is the next step, I would say. And now, you have uh, some clear path that uh, you think? Clear, <laughs> clear is, uh, so at the moment we are uh, working together uh, with people that have done some measurements and for instance in, uh, Roma La Sapienza, they, they, they have some, some experience on that. Uh, and also what we are looking uh, at is uh, there are some um, uh, data uh, from uh, CNES, for instance, they flew uh, a lot of balloons uh, at this altitude and they have some data on the atmosphere itself. So can we use that uh, to compare with the model first to develop uh, our own models, for instance, uh, and try to help. But it, it is a key issue, uh, I, I, I must admit, that we, have, we are trying to have a way forward, but uh, it, there's a long way to go. Thank you very much. Great. I think uh, we should uh, thank uh, Bruno here uh, one more time. So let's unmute. And I think you can probably even stay unmuted now because there will be probably a couple of uh, applauses. Um, anyway, let's uh, thank Bruno one more time. Thank you. Great. Uh, so be before we go, I, I would propose before we go into the final uh, parts of the session, let us um, take a, a screenshot of, of everybody who's uh, who's participating. So if any, if you guys are happy, please uh, switch on your camera, and then we can. Um, I will try and attempt to uh, do, do a countdown and uh, screenshot. So let let me see what I can do here. Yes, this is great. Okay, so. Everybody, um, cheese. Okay, let's do one more. Maybe, um, yes, let me, I don't want to, no, this is bad. Okay, there we go. And then we do another one um, for the fun. Oh, too bad that Carlo is, uh, is not there. Carlo, are you there? Yes, great, excellent. Okay, um, that, that, that is excellent. Okay, so cheese everyone. One more time, yes, cheese. Yes. Perfect, very good. Um, uh, I dare say that the recordings will be made uh, available uh, later on online, so we will probably have uh, um, get get those recordings in any case, so that will be nice to 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 have a look uh, at things again. Um, uh, we 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 were planning to have like a discussion session, but I think we ran kind of out of time. I was I was chairing very badly. I think Andrea did a much better job on Monday, uh, keeping everybody on track. But I think we had had at least some nice discussions in between. So that's that's very nice, and 
I hope everybody um, enjoyed the session today. Um, thanks a lot, of course, to all the speakers today and, and uh, obviously also those speakers from Monday again. Uh, I think uh, it was very nice in terms of highlighting all the signs uh, that we have uh, that, that is there for spectral distortions. And um, we are all scared about the measurement, uh, obviously, and it's very difficult, going to be very difficult. But, you know, at least the time frame of uh, 2050 is still a long time. Um, so young people uh, can can still come up with hopefully creative <laughs> ideas to 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 make this happen. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, I I think uh, I want to thank obviously Andrea very uh, very uh, give him a big uh, round of applause. Maybe we can uh, uh, give him a round of applause right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me yeah. just no no let no me no just no. Uh, I'm not echo. I'm not done okay, yet. sorry. Um, because Andrea has been doing really uh, most of the work uh, uh, to put to write all the emails to everyone and and uh, send around all the information and and Phil I have I have not once touched the Indico uh, system so Andrea has been taking care of everything there um, so he has really immensely helped with with all of this and and um, obviously has been doing a really great job on on uh, not Monday I'm always saying Monday on Tuesday uh, when the first session was happening. Um, so, so again, uh, thanks a lot, Andrea, for for doing all this. And uh, and I want to give a round of applause to all the speakers, of course, again as well. Uh, uh, so let's let's do that as well, that as well. Um, let me just uh, echo Jens's word before it's too late. Uh, we get uh, disconnected. Uh, in uh, thanking right, everybody for. Uh, attending uh, for attending uh, the, the conference and participating and uh, I mean giving a very exciting talk they were all I mean all the talk was so nice to be honest and like uh, uh, yeah uh, making it lively with the questions uh, with your questions and so on and so forth so thank you very much and thanks to Jens as well because like I mean he, now now he's playing modest but he did uh, he did well oh, I, I I was really just surfing along uh, so it's it's really great Andrea thanks a lot for for all your effort um, yeah, uh, I think um, we are going to be kicked out in a couple of minutes. Uh, one more thing that uh, might come up, um, uh, there is the plan to write some kind of level of proceedings, as I understand. Uh, the organizers uh, of, of the Master Grossman meeting will send around information. We have also not received any details as far as I know yet, um, uh, but we will, we will communicate that and then see what we can, what we can maybe contribute to, to this. Um, uh, uh, proceedings, which will be uh, published um, online, as I understand. Um, so, so that will be also another opportunity to highlight uh, more broadly to the community what are the uh, possibilities. And I think, in particular, uh, with respect to the experimental um, side, uh, activities like Cosmo uh, at Dome C and also uh, also Bizu, uh, it is it, it it is I think really important that we that we make available some, some more detailed information uh, on that in documented form as well, so that one can start citing, um, which, is, which is, I think, also another, another thing that we might be having as an idea here. Um, yeah, other than that, I, I, think, um, uh, um, uh, I think we can, we can probably uh, adjourn, as we, as we say, and um, uh, it's, it's, it's great to see that, that so many people uh, were able to join. And uh, we also had uh, several people who are not so uh, not so familiar with the topic uh, join. So that that was really really nice. Um, and uh, yeah, I think um, that that's that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> all right. Well. Thank you. Exactly. And yeah. Thanks again to everyone. And uh, I'm sure we will get together uh, fairly soon, especially uh, with the. Uh, with the um, uh, with the perspective of Voyage 2050, there will be lots of discussions that have to be had. So, uh, lots of activity, hopefully. Great. All right then. Thanks a lot to everyone. Thanks, Thanks to safe, you. Safe, yes. safe travel Thank back. <laughs> Ciao. <Great. laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.